Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Bat Minute. Um, hiatus? I guess it's the first the first hiatus episode of this season. Beetle Minute. Beetle Minute. Beetlemania Minute. <laughs> uh, there is a Beetlejuice Minute, though, isn't there? <laughs> there, was, there well, there was. There was like, yeah. We'll talk about them when, when we get into it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, um, we are the podcast that uh, left the cake out in the rain. Um, <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, I can't wait, cannot wait to talk about that. <laughs> but yes, first hiatus episode of uh, of the season, even though technically we've got one episode left of Batman Beyond to go, but it, I won't date the episode um, by yeah, saying Yeah, who that. knows when this is actually releasing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we are here to review the film that I never thought was actually going to exist, Beetlejuice oh. 2. Or Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, or not called Beetletooth or Beetledeuce, which is just quite frankly a missed opportunity. Beetlejuice uh, is Beetle fantastic. Deuce. As soon as you said that, I was sold. Yeah, I think particularly because like well, Deuce can also mean like taking a dump as well. <laughs> so it, it, it adds even more. To, like... uh, but yeah, I'm one of the hosts, Niall McGowan. and the host with the most is back. It's me, John Parker. Ooh, I had ooh. to do it. I just completely stole the tagline i don't care the other tagline is worth the wait which i thought was a bold claim yeah but it is a bold claim but not getting into many spoilers but might be inaccurate i, uh, I mean i'm gonna i'm gonna spoil it i agree yeah, it's yeah. worth the wait <laughs> uh but yes we are joined by another uh another voice not another guest because john's not a guest john's one of the co-hosts <laughs> um, <laughs> i can be both we've got the oh the next scene podcaster a man who we can manifest by saying his name three times, and we have Sean German, Sean German, Sean German. Hello, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, apparently, I've been wrongly assigned to this podcast upon my death. So uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, about you, on Sean, because I think you're—I know you to be a Beetlejuice fan, and I know you're—I think you're the only person I know who's seen the musical. As well, like live, mm. you went uh, actually went and got tickets for it. And stuff, yeah, so. I actually went and saw the the musical live. It, yeah, it was it was very it was in and out of the theaters very quickly, and even more quickly. This was just before uh, twenty twenty. Um, mm. I think it did. I think it did come back, but yeah, the original run on Broadway was cut short because of because um, mm. everything was cut short for for a period there. But, I, I think though, because I, I was because I was actually like sort of I got into the musical through. It's still not been released over here. You can get it on cruise ships, but you can't get it over here. You can get it in like what? Japan, but you can't get it over here. Um, what like a recording of it? No, no, like you can just. They'll just put it on on cruise ships. It's it's toured other countries, just oh, it's not touring on the ship. Yeah, <laughs> apparently you, you will go what? on a tour ship, and they're like, we're having, you know, the Music Man and Beetlejuice, like actual, actual <laughs> actors on the ship acting it out and singing yeah. and everything. No, that's nuts. That's not the same though, because everything I've seen of that musical, that is like a production. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. See, like I, the, the thing that sucked me in because I was just like Beetlejuice musical. Come on, get out of here! And then I just saw the pictures of the sets, and I was like, "Oh, that looks that looks good." Yeah. <laughs> and then you you look into it, it's like it's not perfect, but it is. It's pretty entertaining. Um, well, and I think we've talked about this before when we've done Beetlejuice content. But when I first saw the guy playing Beetlejuice in that musical, I went, "No, no." And then I watched a clip of him, and I was like, "Yes, he, this he, rocks." Yeah. He makes it work. It was actually uh, I don't I don't have the name. I don't remember the name, but he's the same guy. In the School of Rock Broadway oh. musical, he played the Jack Black part. Yeah. Um, oh. So it's 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 a different sort of energy, and he doesn't play Beetlejuice the same way he plays Jack Black. But right. it, it, it's it's one of those things where like sometimes you look at like actors who are up for a role, and you were like, you know, okay, that'd be different, but not necessarily bad. And mm-hmm. I would say, yeah, he's he's not, you know, he's not, you know. Mikey Keats. Yeah. Uh, he's, it's definitely a different sort of energy, but it's not bad. And there were some things, I don't know if you've, if you haven't seen it, if you've looked into the plot, the storyline of the oh, musical, yeah. they, um, they kind of borrowed some things much, much, much like a, um, a noted hack has done with Batman. <laughs> they've, they've taken some plot points. Well, in that case, they, they should have got Beetlejuice from the stage, a cameo in the movie. That would have been nice. Yeah. Yeah, but I was kind of assuming that the I know that guy, right, Alex right. Brightman, his name is. 
Yeah. Uh, and he's really owned it because he voiced Beetlejuice on Teen Titans Go oh, as well. Okay. Like, And he's really like, that's a man who's thrown himself into like, yes, I am this character now. I'm I'm willing to represent him as much as for as long as I possibly can. Except now Michael Keaton's come <laughs> and gone. You're like, <laughs> my, my character. Yeah. Yeah. So, Step aside, Junior. Yeah. But I remember like, it's one of those weird ones because every time I've seen bootlegs with him and the original Lydia was Sophia Ann Caruso who was mm-hmm. perfect as well yeah. Great. and then every other time you see clips from it when it's not them it's always the most miscast people you'll just get a guy a normal yeah. guy playing Beetlejuice playing him like a normal guy and you'll get like really happy chirpy ladies playing Lydia and you're like do, do the people understand what the story like you got it so perfect the first time when you cast these people why can't you do this again but every mm-hmm. time they're just like featuring mm-hmm. some <laughs> Asshole, as Beetlejuice, he comes out. He's like, "Hello, everyone. I'm Beetlejuice." And you're like, "No, no, <laughs> no, you're not." <laughs> but- well, weirdly, that um, that perfectly ties into the movie we're going to talk about because I thought that, like, when I saw the trailers, I was concerned. Mm, mm. I thought they're not capturing the vibe. They're not getting the whole atmosphere. But then, seeing the finished product, they got the assignment. A hundred percent. They yeah. even if you if people don't love the movie, whatever, it's got the right vibe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We might as well get it out of the way for every, everyone here. John, you seem to be skewing positive. Um, oh, oh yeah, I f- Letterbox. I gave it a five out of five. This wow. is one of the best best things I've ever experienced in my life. Best cinema experience wow. in, in about ten years. Wow, wow, better than Cats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did. I genuinely that was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, that was at the start of COVID as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that brought COVID yeah. about. Um, I, I, I will say I'm also very, very positive on this. I was went in with rock, like rock bottom expectations, and then like midway through, it was just like I'm having so much fun with this. This is this is really, really like yeah, it's just blowing it out of the water. I wouldn't go five out of five perfect, and I don't know if it's one I'll rewatch a lot. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. for what it was. It did deliver and everything that I kind of hoped that it would. So, but Sean, what did you think of uh, Be- Beetlejuice? I'm, I'm kind of a a in the middle, mm-hmm. um, maybe a blend, I, and quite the opposite for from you, Nile. Is I think I will watch this a lot, and I have a feeling I'm kind of on on first watch. I'm like, okay, good, but not great. I have a feeling it's one of those things that's going to grow on me. Mm. I am looking forward to when it when it comes to home video and I can rewatch it. And I think um, I think it'll get better over time. Yeah. Right right now, I'm kind of in the middle. I can see what they did. I think they did. I think there's some mistakes. There's some things they could have cut and kind of paid more attention to other plot lines or storylines. But um, overall, positive. Well, I think I know what you're referring to, maybe here, because mm-hmm. I even though I'm saying five out of right, it's it's a tough one because th- there are things you could criticize, right? Mm. Like really. Why is Beetlejuice's ex-wife in the movie? Well, that that's my my one main <laughs> critique is because I was into that storyline. I was really yeah. like, I can't wait to see where they're going with this. And they go nowhere with it. <laughs> like, yeah. it it's the biggest damp squib ever. Like it just gets to like you're you're dying to see the two of them interact again. And they get like, oh, what's going to go down? Like this is going <laughs> to like this is all new territory. And then to get there and it's just like, yeah, she's just taken out the way the Beetlejuice was taken out at the end of the first movie. Also during a wedding, during his marriage to Lydia. And it's just like, mm. oh, yeah, that just sort of, <laughs> that well, you just didn't have anything there, did you? Like, it felt see, like- I, I agree, even though I think the movie's perfect. It, we, I, well, not perfect, yeah, nothing's perfect. But I agree, but I had so much fun watching it and watching her, I didn't care. Mm. <laughs> I was like, mm. I, every time you see it, great, she's back. Brilliant! I don't care. She's, she's been gone for half an hour. <laughs> she, she she is great, and like, yeah, can't falter at all. And it, it, there is a little element as well of like Tim Burton can't help himself because of course he's <laughs> he's currently going out with Monica Bellucci, yeah. and I think he just has a like don't people got to see the hot broad I'm going out with? Like you know, this is what happened with so many <laughs> films with Helen and Bonham Carter, yeah. Lisa Marie back in Mars Attacks, like the big freaking like and Van, she played vampire and Ed Woods. Tim Burton just likes like. Well, everyone, uh, here's my girlfriend. <laughs> just so, just so you know, I'm I'm tapping that. <laughs> He's just going to have to get her in the movie somehow. And I've got a couple of. I think he had the idea of. Oh, I want a scene of a, this a chopped up body coming back together. <gasps> that was amazing, though. And, that and, was. Great. Am I the only one? This is going to sound so weird. Stapling herself back together. 
it was kind of erotic. Mm. Oh, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I think he also had the idea of like, oh, sucking someone's soul out. And then like their <sighs> eyes deflating and everything. He's like, I think he had that visual. And he's like, I want to do that. I don't really know how. And then he just got cobbled together. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll get Monica in here somehow. They're doing this. And then, yeah, that story just sort of resolved itself. And But it's weird because... Uh, I've been talking to people about it, and we've obviously we talked about Tim Burton quite a bit in our what like two hundred and forty plus <laughs> minute coverage of Batman oh, yeah. and Batman Returns. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And one of the big things we always have to come back to with him, because people always throw meaning on Tim Burton movies that I don't think is there, because I don't think he thinks about meanings. I think he's very much a <laughs> I just like visuals, I like vibes, I like funny things. Uh, he doesn't think about that's why he comes out with like clueless statements about the whole when people are saying why his movie's so ca- heavily Caucasian and he was just like I just don't think about that like it's like when they got yeah. that Asian kid on the Brady Bunch and I was like what the hell is he doing here and people are like you racist piece of crap Tim Burton and I'm like I don't think he meant it that way I think he was just more like I just cast whoever because I'm just I don't care <laughs> like, he's just in his own little world yeah maybe he should care more but I don't think he d- yeah he's a, uh, he's a man he who means has malice behind it. <laughs> There's a man who went to had Christmas dinner with the then Prime Minister of England when he was married to Helen Bonham Carter and didn't know who he was. Like, that's how, in, in his own little world, Tim Burton is. He's just like, oh, I understand this, this guy, David, that my wife knows is apparently a big deal. Okay. So we, so we shouldn't read anything into the fact that his love interest is literally sucking the soul well, out that's of men. What I was, that's what I was going to say, because there does seem to be, it might be more down to the screenwriters, to be fair, because it's the guys who did yeah. the Wednesday show. Uh, back right in this yeah, yeah. there's a recurring thing throughout like now both movies where marriage seems to be a very negative thing and is this tim working through his po- post-divorce blues a hundred percent his relationship yeah. sort of uh, they've never gone well have they no well they're up now with monica but we'll see how that, <laughs> we'll oh, see wow. how that <laughs> but no the fact that he has like you got here beetlejuice himself gets married to monica bellucci she kills him and then now she's, he's got this like betroth undead thing haunting him throughout the afterlife, <laughs> coming straight, straight for him. Uh, the, the marriage between Lydia and Beetlejuice itself is um, deemed to be a negative thing. I've got thoughts on it that I think we went to in our commentary, mm. where I'm just like, oh, I'll get, I'll get to it, I'll get to it when we get down the line. But I've got questions about that for one thing. And then um, three, the wedding between uh, Lydia and Rory, Justin Theroux's character. Is also a thing where you're just like, why are you doing this? Like that has bad vibes all over it as well. So the oh, cost- I loved that aspect of it though. Like as soon as you meet that guy, you're like, what a jerk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Louis Theroux's cousin as well, John. You know, like oh, that, that blows my mind every time I remember. Yeah, but he's uh, but yeah, but as you're alluding to there, Sean, like yeah, literally the portrayal of Beetlejuice's wife and this is like a soul sucking monster who he can't get away from. It really feels like there is a thematic thread going through there, <laughs> whether that be from Tim Burton or from the writers or for whatever. But it does seem to have, and I, in many ways, I took it to be a, and I've seen various interpretations in the, you know, the week since it's come out, where I thought at the end it was sort of a nice empowering thing that it was just Lydia and her daughter and they had made up, and then at the end Lydia is just like an empowered lady by herself, just living life. Uh, and she doesn't, doesn't need, need she doesn't, no man. Doesn't need no mm-hmm. man. Doesn't need no codepe- no codependency on anyone. She's just it's just her and her daughter. And then you know it's her in the bed by herself at the end. Even though there's a little bit where Beetle just pops up. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen other yeah. people though say that like oh it's so sad though that she just ends what? up by herself at the end. Like no, I say like, I don't think it was meant that way. I, yeah. think. <laughs> I think yeah I think you know the overall message I found very positive and empowering for for all three generations to see. Um, you know, to see Delia and Lydia sort of make, you know, make their peace and, and and they get along now and they kind of they've gotten over the the animosity that they had in the first movie. And then, yeah, at the end, we see Lydia and Astrid have uh, reconciled. Mm, so mm. I thought that was really nice and, and a very positive message. And, yeah, Rory is the worst. And, um, you know, if. If being single is bad, which I'm not saying it is, but, you know, if you think it's bad, then, you know, being with someone like Rory just so you're not alone is is worse. So I think that's what the message is, is like, yeah. no, no, you can be happier on your own. That's fine. Yeah. That's great. Because she yeah. doesn't she doesn't even want to marry him. He basically pressures her into it, and she's like, oh, okay, yeah. I mm. guess. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh that uh, – and I, I don't know if we're trying to 
kind of stick to the order of the, the way things have and move, you know, nah, kind of chronological or the way things are like that proposal, like that is <laughs> that, oh, like, <laughs> like just, well, just, I mean, public proposals in general, like the people that are at a sport event and oh, like they're yeah. up on the jumbotron and stuff like that's horrible. That's just wrong. Like you should say no and walk out if, mm. if anyone ever does that to you, but then to do it at your father's funeral, oh, crazy your father's <laughs> wake, like, that's just disgusting. That was the, it feels like every single person there is aghast at it except yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> like literally yeah. everybody is like, this is a horrible, horrible idea. But yeah. he seems to be everyone's just like, well, we better go along with what he's <laughs> what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's take a hint. Like even Delia, who is over the top with her art and everything is a demonstration and attention, and like even she's like, that's too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I do it's also so it. perfect for his character. Because he's so slimy, and and you know he's up to something. You know he's not marrying her for love. So yeah. it's like, oh, well, you know. what's your game? What's your game? I do love the other throughout the rest of the movie. After that, every time Lydia and Delia talk, <laughs> Delia's always like, "So you're calling off the wedding?" <laughs> and just like, <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, she's she's she." Delia yeah. Dietz is somehow our audience surrogate now, where we're like, one hundred percent on yeah. her side. Yeah, you should be calling off yeah. that wedding. But I, I did love their relationship in this because they didn't. Uh. They didn't try to tip it over into anything too saccharine because uh, mm-hmm. it was very much like, oh, if you've seen the original movie, you know that, yeah, Delia and Lydia don't get on. It's not her mother. It's not her actual mother. And it just they just had this kind of it felt very real and very natural where it's just like, yeah, we don't really we didn't get along for a long time there. And uh, but now you've grown up now and I've kind of calmed down a bit and. Yeah, we're we're cool. Like we're just sort of yeah. Yeah, there's, we're not right. we're we're family, but we're not really old. we're not that tight because the implication at the end of the first movie is that Lydia has new parents in the Maitlands. Like that's yes, which is mm-hmm. one of the kind of problems I have with this is that the Maitlands are just brushed off so easily. Uh, whereas yeah, but it, it also makes sense though, doesn't it? What the explanation you get? But it, 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 it just would have like I would have liked a like maybe a flashback to them leaving or something because mm. what, what I interpreted what was happening with Lydia in this and I've seen some people have had problems with uh, not Winona's performance because like she's fantastic but like just the characterization of her as a kind of meeker sort of more anxiety riddled character who's like mm-hmm. and I've seen Winona in interviews going like that she had to do some mental gymnastics herself to go like why would she be with this guy like. Why would she go near this guy? He's clearly such an oily, untrustworthy kind of... And I've seen people, so yeah, have this sort of thing of like, you know, Lydia Deeds is an icon to so many people. So they don't like seeing her in this like, even though, of course... It's a, it's a movie. She has an arc, and by the end, she's you know she's back. Yeah, to, and the, the, and the character's been through a lot off screen. You know, like her her ex husband was it or just partner is dead yeah yeah and apparently um, the marriage did not well so my interpretation of all of this of why lydia is the way she is in this film is because she started off at the beginning of the first movie very lonely teen strange and unusual suicidal at one point yeah. do you recall she was writing, writing a suicide note she actively wanted to kill herself uh one of the best little moments in that first movie is when beetlejuice she, just says to her like Oh yeah, I'm looking to get out, and then she's like, "Oh, I'm looking to get in," and he just kind of looks at her like, "Why?" Like, <laughs> yeah. um, you know. And then by the end of the movie, she has new lease in life. She's making friends in school, and she has new parents in the Maitlands who are like much more attentive to her, and she kind of, they're much more stable. They're like a norm core couple who mm-hmm. pay attention to her and actually care about <laughs> her. Norm core, but they're also weird enough. For that she'd be excited about like hanging out with them because like oh yeah they they bring ghosts to that they've got dead footballers behind me on the stairs now like yeah. she's living her best life so she kind of had all that and then you see throughout the nineties she met a she met a guy who was into like was it Mario Bava and stuff they talk about going to see and she yes. has a kid and so much love and then by the time we get to this movie her father dies her husband's been gone a long time her daughter won't speak to her anymore and the Maitlands are gone. And so it's her back, right? Yeah. So so the reason she's so like, oh God, is because she's like, I'm back to where I was, and I. I, So so that's why I wish that they had emphasized the Maitlands leaving more, because to me that seems to be, oh, my parents are gone. Like not only has my father died, but my actual parents are they've 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 moved on. They they went beyond me. Like they moved on into Mm -hmm. the afterlife where I couldn't. I can speak to the dead. I can't go after them. Like they they've gone somewhere else. Maybe just an extra couple of lines about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, um, 
But I suppose they already had to jump through hoops with uh, getting around the Jeffrey Jones of it all. It's like, we can't have Alec Baldwin show up in this as well. Oh. We just can't. <laughs> like, you, it's, know, you know what? Yeah. I, when I heard, oh, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, the dad's funeral. I was like, okay, cool. That makes sense. That makes sense. I didn't expect the lengths it would go to with that plot point. I thought that was just going to be like, they're, they're meeting for the funeral. That's it. We won't mention it again. Oh, no. The characters in the movie. Oh, I lo- yeah. love it. Sort of. And, and absolutely and that, loving that as well. But go, sorry, go ahead, Sean. Well, just that was my main problem, like in terms of which which parts of the film I didn't like is the amount of time they spend with Charles. Mm. I mean, I like, you know, Tim Burton in the animation. We get the little scene of the plane crashing and the, the shark and everything like that oh, was yeah. nice. But then everything after that, I feel like take that time. Give us more Dolores. Mm. Give us more growth in the relationship between Jeremy and Astrid. Mm. Like that's like they meet. They have the first date. They go to the netherworld. They get their passport stamp. Surprise! I tricked you. You're st- you're stuck here. Like though, that's that's their whole relationship. Those three scenes. I'm like, give us a little bit more there. Give us, you know, again, yeah. more Dolores, more Monica. Like that's great. We want more of that. Mm. And get rid of all this side Charles stuff. I mean, I guess it does pay off in the end. Um, and you were talking about marriage. Mm. And we get to see some some good aspects of marriage. I think Adam and Barbara were a healthy relationship in the first one. And we see Charles. Um, we get a better picture of Charles and Delia. I think in the first one, you're like, why are these two together? They don't really seem to fit. And <laughs> like here we get we get a sense of the the love between them and they they do end up together at the end, which is sweet. Mm. But yeah, the 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 stuff with just yeah, Charles walking around the netherworld. <laughs> I, I, we, we could have missed. I just, I uh, we, we, just reminded me, I love that line I, I, though, of, um, cause he's going around literally chomped in two. <laughs> yeah. Blood, <laughs> blood everywhere. And yeah. then when Delia meets him, she's like, Charles, look what happened to me. Yeah. Look what happened to me. <laughs> That's so looks exactly the same. Yeah. Well, particularly the reason he's like, I could see if this was like Bruce Willis or Val Kilmer, if there was like some medical reason, like some sad reason why the actor couldn't come back and we wanted to memorialize him or Mm. celebrate him in some way, even though he can't be in the film, like, okay. But the reason Jeffrey Jones is no longer (laughs) acting is like, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's good that he's not acting anymore, but like, yeah. Like, so why, you know, like, and I know it's, and, and, you know, you said like, you know, Tim Burton doesn't think that much about these things. And there's other, you know, there are other writers. He didn't, he didn't write this, but it feels like, why are you, it feels like a celebration of, oh, here's this actor who can't be in the film, but we want to feature him anyway. But it's like, mm. no, this is not someone you should be featuring. I, I, I would agree there because I thought it was odd. And again, I've seen some reviews say that like, oh, it's really sticking it to Jeffrey Jones because like, oh, he's got chomped into by a shark. <laughs> well, it was a bit. It was. <laughs> but then I like also... That. They use his image multiple times, yeah. which I'm assuming he would get some sort mm-hmm. of check for. And yeah, it almost yeah. feels like he's worked yeah. with Tim Burton at least twice. So it was like Sleepy Hollow and Beetlejuice. Oh, actually, no, and Ed Wood as well, of course, because he's, uh, we call him Crystal. Oh, yeah, Ed Wood. Yeah. So right. I wonder if there was a little bit of Tim Burton being like, this is my friend Jeffrey. He can't get work anymore. Uh-huh. I'm yeah. going to, I'm like, I'm making a sequel to a movie he was in. I'll get around this somehow and get him, I'll get him a couple of. I get him a couple of bucks by like putting his likeness in the film and stuff. And then I don't know. I can't confirm that or not. Like, it's like he's like, I can't have him in the film, but I can do what I can to make sure he's getting like a paycheck out of this. It's I possible. hope not. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, it's possible. Not. Um, yeah. but I also wouldn't be surprised if, if, um, like if I was, God forbid, if I was Jeffrey Jones, um, and Tim Burton said, "Can I look? Can I use your image in the movie? It's a beloved movie." To be honest, if I was in his position, I'd go, "Yeah, you know what? Do it." Fine. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. at least it gets you out there. There was a part of me too wondering if um, he had that that guy who ends up playing uh, Astrid's dad. If he had that actor on standby, because he really actually wanted Johnny Depp to play that part, and he's like, "Oh, I could have had like Winona and Johnny Depp together again. Like this would be amazing." And then he's just like, up until the last minute, he's like, "I don't think we'll get away with it." Nah, cast the other guy. <laughs> get that other guy in instead. Uh, which also works a lot more too, because um, obviously Jenna Ortega is a like a Latina actress as well. So having two white people playing her parents might be a bit weird. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but initially I did. That did throw me off, that you know, with um, 
Winona Ryder b- playing her mum, I was like, oh, well, wait a minute. Mm. <laughs> like, that doesn't quite do... work. But then it made sense. Yeah. Also, in the like, Grand Budapest Hotel, though, like F. Murray Abraham, when you <laughs> flash back to him as a kid, there's just like it's a completely different race of actor. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like well, we don't care. Like it's just, I want that. I want him playing on that age. I want him playing on that age. I don't care what race they are. You kind of buy it in those sort of worlds, don't you? You just go, mm. oh, all right then, fine. I suppose yeah, yeah people too would be like if Johnny Depp showed up as her dad. People might be. I'm sure people on the internet would be like, this is outrageous. But most people on face value would be like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah I can sure. imagine she'd be there, kid. Yeah, sure. Um, Why not? Although speaking of her, and you also mentioned you know talking about different guys and different roles and things, um, her love interest is interesting. Um, oh, uh, Astrid's love interest. Yeah, because mm, I was, you know me, I'm a sucker. I fall for things. I didn't know he was tricking her. I, I was. I so... thought it was just gonna. I thought initially, oh, this is gonna be boring. They've brought in a love, like a really crappy teen love story. Nah, they spin it. No, I think I, I, I was in the same boat. Um, I also when he showed up. I was like, oh god, no. Yeah. I uh, don't care about any of this. And I was so happy when he turned out to be like, oh no, he turned out to be like a malignant little piece of crap. I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. I had flashbacks of us watching Wednesday all over again with the love triangles. I thought and stuff. it was the same guy. I was so like, that's, I. I was like, that's that same actor, isn't it? And it's like, no, it's this guy, some other dude who just looks exactly like that guy. Oh, it was such a good swerve because it, well, just, maybe, it saved uh, the whole plot line. Maybe they, the, the writers and Tim and Jenna Ortega were doing a little show because she was out. Remember, Jenna Ortega was very public about saying, I don't agree with this love story. I don't yeah. think she would involve these people. I don't agree with this plot line at all. And it could have been that like they were doing that as a little in-joke to themselves. Like, let people think that we're just basically doing Wednesday again. I and think then so. <laughs> it turned out to be like, no, he's actually a much more... Uh, different to the... No offense to that actor, though, because I think I've looked him up and he's only in two things. Oh, whoa. He's in like House of the Dragon as like a page boy. And now uh, he's in this. How so the he's hell only, did he get this? He's only, <laughs> yeah. I guess he's only starting out. I still think I would have preferred like a more interesting actor because he's mm. he is very like yeah he's a bit he's a bit dreamy for a teen boy I guess and then he's just like yeah he's a bit bland whereas I think they were looking for someone with like an Evan Peters energy oh yeah like you had someone with that kind of like oh he's a hunky teen kid but he's also got this like immense darkness to him where you can imagine him uh, if Evan Peters you know was this character and then you saw that he murdered his family it would all make sense whereas this one's a bit like I love that scene where because again that I thought that was a good misdirect as well because you're so conditioned now in big movies to be like there's gonna be cameos and there's gonna be in <laughs> yeah. jokes and so when uh, Astrid goes into the house and you don't see the parents I was like they're gonna be revealed to be like it'll be like Martin Short Oh. Or one of, one of Tim's old mates is going to they're going to be playing those parts. So then I turn around, I was like, oh, you don't see their face because he's got, he's got like a fucking saw in the middle of it. <laughs> and as well, yeah, the wife's got like, a, like an egg beater jammed into her eye. I was like, oh, great. Like, I think that's why I like the Charles stuff so much too, Sean. And what shocked me about this film was because the first movie's it's a bit intense for little kids, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I watch it all the time when I was a little kid. Um that explains a lot. Well, maybe it probably does. <laughs> yeah, but I'm the like, same. And that probably, yeah, why that makes sense why we uh, are friends. <laughs> so. yeah, but, but then to come in and to have like, yeah, recurring character Charles Dietz as a chomped up corpse <laughs> spurting blood yeah. everywhere. That bit where like be, like the Beetlejuice baby bursts out of Lydia. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then things like, yeah, when you see the kid murder his parents, like, yeah, he, he f- murdered his parents <laughs> like he, they jammed the thing and thing in their face like they are they viciously vi- and then you see him get dragged down to hell i was like i don't know if i would show this to the little kids <laughs> i would be more like this is a 12a certificate or whatever like it's it's probably going to be but i'm sure we'll find an audience with like the six to eight year olds like me you know like ourselves here who probably i would have loved it as a kid myself yeah 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 because yeah. i think that's the appeal of tim burton for a lot of kids is like it's spooky stuff that's actually accessible and targeted towards children, but he does, to be fair to him, also have quite a bit of edge, mm. i.e. all of Batman Returns, where <laughs> the whole movie is like, you didn't think about the kids at all, did you, <laughs> Tim? You just didn't care about trying to market this towards them. Well, uh, speaking of edge and Batman Returns, mm. I thought... Um, Mon- I was going to say Monica Bellucci, as if she did it in the movie. Monica Bellucci killing Danny DeVito. <laughs> that was incredible. I thought that was like, whoa, holy crap, into... sucking out the soul. The first time you see it, it's quite like horrific. Yeah, I thought you were going to go into, into a blob. Uh, 
Marco Bellucci edging. Uh, oh, you know, oh. like, now that's a movie I'll pay to see. <laughs> yeah, I'll fund that. I'll fund that. That's what the people want. Mm-hmm. Well, even just just having Danny DeVito turn up, I was like, oh my god. I was a little disappointed yeah. though that he's 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 missed his streak of uh, every Tim Burton movies, and he always gets an insanely huge top hat. Oh yeah, they're in oh, Dumbo. Man. He shows up in a big top hat. The penguin's got a big top hat. Freaking big fish. He had a big stupid top hat. And like now, this one's like oh. no hats at all on uh, on Danny no. here, unfortunately. Oh, that's a shame. I didn't think about that. But he does get to channel some penguin energy in what he's doing because he's walking around going. Mah, mah. Oh, one hundred percent. Oh yeah. <laughs> Like well, that- and then when he drank the um, out of the bleach or the clean or whatever, and then it's like <laughs> oozing out of him, like oh, that was definitely heavy penguin vibes. Totally. So maybe that's what the. Cause there's a couple of little signals in this, as well. It's like well, what Tim Burton has trying is trying to and probably has successfully recaptured in that like he was a guy who was fired by Disney, like back in the '80s. He made <laughs> yeah. you know Frank and Weenie, and they were like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> and, and cast him out. <laughs> Then years, and of course, then we'll go on to make things like Batman Returns, where they're like, what the hell is this, man? <laughs> and I got him his reputation. I was like, oh, cool, dark, weird director who does like it. But the, the kids love him, but they're not supposed to and stuff. And then he ended up in like, he remade Frank and Weenie for Disney. as a, at a very, And he, he, he blames himself for the spate of Disney live action remakes because he did Alice in Wonderland and that made like a billion dollars or whatever. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, he went and kind of like criticized it in Dumbo. He was like trying to like bite the hand that feeds, but also it wasn't enough for me because I'm like, but you're still doing it, Tim. You're still working for Disney. Mm. You're still like f- getting them millions for like mm-hmm. brain dead, like just IP regurgitation stuff. Even though we're talking about a Beetlejuice sequel here, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> but like now he seems to be like, yeah, um, he's gone away. Having Danny DeVito back, channeling the Penguin. Yes. In the little scenes like that, and then there's a later on bit where um, Lydia's talking to. Little Jane from the first movie. Because yeah, remember, there was Jane who was trying to sell the house, and then they mentioned Little Jane in the back car. And now Little Jane is a character in the movie. Oh, yeah. And she's got Little or Jane. <laughs> little or Jane. And then the, 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 but she's going through about their Halloween costumes, and she's got the mm-hmm. pink sweater that says mortgage backwards because she's a reverse mortgage. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was clever. Though. Uh, and then they, they have a little thing that's like, yeah, no Disney. Or one thing. No Disney. One, well, no Disney. And Lydia <laughs> kind of gives her like a little like head nod of like, I get it. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems to be Tim going, that era is gone. I'm not doing that anymore. Oh, yeah. In interviews before this, he I can't remember his exact wording, but he basically said, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm yeah. not doing that ever again. I'm free. Mm. <laughs> it's like he was he, he finally got married to Monica Bellucci and she got him out of the netherworld that was the Disney <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> Monica Bellucci could resurrect anyone <laughs> <laughs> but David Lynch was it with like, middle aged directors perfect on Monica Bellucci basically <laughs> back in like Twin Peaks The Return too like the guy had that Monica Bellucci dream <laughs> <laughs> completely out of nowhere just a random two minutes of Monica Bellucci yeah. talking to you all the all the hoopla because there's so many they announced the cast these the, the cast list for Twin Peaks The Return and everyone's like why are all these people in it They're like who's Michael Cera playing who's Tim Roth playing and then when you watch it like Monica Bellucci's in this where is she and then she just shows up as Monica Bellucci just so David Lynch can sit and have a scene with Monica Bellucci because he, <laughs> he just wants to hang out with her in France or something yeah he's just like well, let's, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna die soon anyway so I might as well <laughs> just get the, the most I can out of this it's um yeah yeah so I, I appreciate it on that level i do think that it's and the fact that it's done so well it's such a huge hit in the u.s mm. with families all over the place despite all the kind of weird and a little bit too dark stuff in it is like a real fair play tim you did it yeah you came back man mm-hmm. you're, you're, you seem yeah. now i don't know what you're going to do next but like at present you just take this win has been like yeah you, you made it. so i will say like i love so much of this in that I went in with such an arched eyebrow of like a... Oh, same. Because you know, the original movie is so near and dear to my heart. And you can listen to our commentary. Me and John did a couple of years back where we just sit and gush about it for like an hour and a half. We'll do one for this. We probably will eventually, yeah. Um, and then so going in with that attitude and then like I think it was around the time when they did all the stuff with the Soul Train... And it was just oh, a big. Oh, you didn't like that. Yeah. I thought no. that was like, really funny. No, no, that's what I'm saying. When they did that, and it was a big stupid pun about the show Soul Train, but no one of this generation will get Tim. It's just old man Tim Burton finds that funny, and it's a high energy disco dance around. And I was sitting with a huge smile on my face, going like, "I'm loving this. This is just so. It's so like goofy and stupid, and just like 
we're just having fun here. Like, we're just, you know, you, you can't take Beetlejuice seriously. Come on. Like, this no. is what we do. And I love the fact that every time Beetlejuice himself brings up the Soul Train, he seems to love it. Because he's always like, oh, the Soul Train. And he does a little, like, <laughs> as if, oh, I had a great time on the Soul Train, too. <laughs> that, no, that was my favorite bit. It's something you mentioned there about the Soul Train sequence is 90% of people watching it won't have a clue what the gag is. No. No, even, and that's great. It's just for Tim. <laughs> it's just Tim and people of Tim Burton's age and a little bit younger, like like us, who would, yeah. would get the joke. But even then, people would be like, it's, they're playing disco music. It's not soul music. <laughs> like, how does this joke work? It's, like, it's specifically referencing an old show from the 70s that has been off the air for about 50 years now. <laughs> Incredible. Absolutely amazing. Every time it did it, because it came back a couple of times, I thought it was going to be a one-off gag. It's like, no, no, no. No, no, no. no. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it has that, um, and it looks like a dirty, like New York kind of subway train as well. Which yeah, really like, yeah, subway vibe. Yeah. Speaking of silly uh, stuff that I loved as well as the Soul Train, there. Um, I'm trying to remember the character's name. I I loved uh, Ghost Detective Wolf Jackson. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Again, there's no need for him to be in the movie, but he's fantastic. Oh, what's his name? It's like his you know, character name is it's like. Like Frank Hardbreaker or something, like the, the character he played. Was. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Everything about him, it's just a joy to watch, I think. And he, he, he was a real harkening back to like old school effects as well, because the kind of prosthetic they put on him just looks really fake. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think is kind of like, no, this movie, though, it works because mm-hmm. it is all it's supposed to look stop motion y and it's supposed to look so. Yeah, he like on set he held a grenade too long, and it turned out it was a live grenade. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, so over the top, but it's fun. It works. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, even was... in this universe, he's pretending to be a detective, kind of, because that's what he did in movies. Yeah, he's, mm-hmm. he seems to have assigned himself <laughs> this job of yeah. like, I was a detective <laughs> in movies, so now I'm gonna be. You feel like you could make a TV show about that guy? Oh God, yes. He's just like yeah, undead. Pre- previously alive detective actor oh, <laughs> now I thinks want that he's this, an undead. but Defoe wouldn't sign up for that surely I don't know I think Defoe might <laughs> like he, he seems to be just like <laughs> yeah I'll do I, I loved him in interviews though because he's clearly not all that familiar with the original Mm. And they're just like, so what's it like being in like the Tim Burton world? And like, what's your opinion of Beetlejuice? And he's just like, I'm not really too fussed about all that. But like, I was on set and I had all this put, stuff put on top of me. I look at the sets; they were incredible. Like, I had a great time. I just, I was loving being there. <laughs> like, yeah, he's a paying paid actor. Showed up and like, I'll, I'll play the part. I'll play the hell out of this part. I don't care about anything else as long as I have a good time. But, you can tell he's having fun. That's what matters as well. You can tell he's. Just, he might even be ad libbing some of that. I don't know. This is little bits like I think at the end when everything's resolved, and like Lydia and um, Astrid are there, and I don't think they even really know who he is. <laughs> but he's just yeah. like, okay, I, I got a second for a selfie though. And he's like, he strikes a pose, <laughs> and, the and they're just like, what? <laughs> what? What's happening? Here? Yeah. Amazing. And his point there about the sets, I was so relieved that m- most of it was practical, and then when mm-hmm. they did CGI, they tried to keep it kind of looking a bit stop motiony and stuff like that mm, mm. they didn't just make it oh we can do crazy over the top you know well alice in wonderland effects no 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 we're not doing that it has to fit the the world of beetlejuice yeah right yeah yeah well i like that the sandworm yeah. kind of matches and that the, the you know when they're on saturn like all that really matched up well with with the original really mm. did it felt with like it, i didn't feel like they had um you know snazzed it up too much or anything like that mm. That was the thing, though, Sean, because now I know you you know the musical. And mm-hmm. one of my uh, hitches with the original Beetlejuice is a thing I think they they fix in the musical where um, obviously so everything about like the 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 the, the wedding between Beetlejuice and Lydia, like we'll have to come. I said we'll come back to it because I got a note on it mm-hmm. um, is like. All right, so we'll do do this in two parts. The, just in fact, what actually happens to him at the end of the first movie? I believe even on our commentary, we're just like, yeah, what does happen to him at the end of the first movie? Because <laughs> he wants to come back from the the afterlife, presumably because I, I guess he's just like he's such a hedonist and whatever. He's just bored now over there, yeah. and he's just like, I just need to get out of here. Uh, and the only way to do that is to come back and be alive, which is kind of one of those things. Put a pin in this. If you, he comes back and he's alive and he's just a normal guy, how's that a problem? Like. That's yeah. Everyone, he can't do crazy Beetlejuice stuff anymore. Yeah, that, well, be that, now we know his background though. Mm, well, but, but still, but still, but, but we'll come back. We'll come back to it. So then, at the end of the movie, 
uh, which is a phenomenal scene. Can't you know? Can't everything you know from that exorcism beginning with uh, Otho right up until the sandworm comes in is just a magnificent bit of filmmaking. But I never got like he's in the middle of getting married. He doesn't get married, mm. and then Barbara comes in with the sandworm. Uh, even though it's time supposed to work differently on Saturn, so how she got back, so it's like it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't matter. You, you don't uh, question it; you just you just buy it, go along with it. But like, and then the sandworm eats Beetlejuice, and then we see him back at the waiting room as if he died again. Yeah, uh, and he did yeah. that because he didn't become undead. And I know the reason that that waiting room scene is in there is because it's a re- it's a it's an added added on scene from test screenings. They were like, oh, people really love the character. Put a little bit of him at the end, and so that's you why. know he's not gone. Yeah, like, that's why he's there. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think originally they were like, yeah, he gets eaten by the sandworm. That's, the sandworm is a threat to ghosts because if you get eaten by a sandworm, even if you're a ghost, that's the end of you. Mm. And then they're like, so they were like, oh, Beals is just go- he's gone. Uh, but they're like, no, he's not gone. He's back at the waiting room. And you're like, but why? He <laughs> And I know in the musical, they have, I think he does get married to Lydia and he comes back to life and she instantly kills him. <laughs> uh, like out of spite <laughs> which is a nice little note because I know in the musical Lydia's a much more like she's, like, oh, she's got a lot more edge <laughs> she's, a, she's a proper little asshole a lot of the time as well yeah, uh, yeah she's manipulating Beetlejuice a lot and getting what she getting what she wants out of him quite a lot of the time and then she's like yeah I've married you oh and he has a moment of like I can breathe I can smell I can taste again and then she's just like shoves him down a hole and he's instantly dead <laughs> and it's like <laughs> yeah that works that should have been the end of the original movie was that he comes back to life and then he instantly gets eaten by the sandworm and he ends up right back where he started, which is kind of inferred, but also not really clear in terms of the lore. Um, but that's, yeah, that's one my one note from, um, you know, from the original movie. And this one, they're just like, yeah, they bring back the sandworms are just kind of there and there's a right. presence that are around. But then, so... The rules, the, the rules do seem to be a little fuzzy on how, you know, the netherworld and everything works. Although this does speak well for Beetlejuice because now we learn he could have tricked Lydia into reading that, you know, that spell or incantation from the book and, you know, kind of swap places and, and you know, be alive that way True. rather than marrying her. Well, so, I've, like, I've, I've been saying this like, all week because I've, obviously I've been in the midst of Beetle mania myself because I'm just so happy yeah. this is all back. <laughs> and I've come to the conclusion that good guy Beetlejuice did nothing wrong because what? you, you yeah. look at that first movie okay he the people are like oh he's trying to marry a child it's very it's shown in the film it's a green card scenario well oh, he a, does explicitly yeah. describe that he said doesn't he call it like a marriage of Mar- marriage of convenience he's marriage like he said you think of it a marriage of convenience i get out you get to be hooked up to the most eligible bachelor since <laughs> valentino <laughs> crossover we're even babe. <laughs> so good guy beetlejuice she lydia comes to him Okay, well, actually, just even go back to the start. The Maitland's calling him. He's like, you want someone out of your house? I want to get someone out of your house. He enters into the, what he thinks is a deal with them. True. He then yeah. attacks them as the Maitland. He attacks the Dietzes as a snake. And then the Maitland's give out to him. And he's just like, I was, you wanted rid of them. I was getting rid of them for you. What do you want? I thought we had a deal. Later, right. Lydia comes to him. He's like, so, my friends are getting exercised. Do something to help. And Beetlejuice is like, yeah, I'll help doesn't have to after True. the deal is made and then she agrees i'll marry you as long as you save them he goes out he gets rid of the he saves the he saves the maitlands doesn't have to he could have just been like i'm out i'll do whatever the hell i want but he actually makes good on his deal and then he's like okay we're getting married then and then lydia's like no i'm not marrying you <laughs> yeah it's like True. just marry like, just marry him and then divorce him <laughs> and just be like he just needs the thing to get over the edge and then this yeah. movie the same deal. Lydia comes home and is like, I need you to help me do this to get save Astrid's soul from this weird serial killer kid that she hooked up with. Mm. Beetlejuice is the guy who sends that guy to hell. He makes good on his deal. And then he's like, yeah, we're getting married. You said you were <laughs> going to do that. I want out of the afterlife. Like, that's all that I want. That's like, yeah, good guy Beetlejuice didn't do anything. He is a pervert. He is a sleazebag. He's <laughs> There's obviously, nothing wrong with that. You know, well, is, there is, but you know. <laughs> Well, I, th- I had this debate with someone actually in work earlier because another person was growing up in the first movie. Mm. And I was like, yeah, it's weird in this one that they make him like obsessed with Lydia because it doesn't come across like that. In the original film, he's like, he ha- when he's, to be fair, when he's the snake, he sees her and he gives her kind of like a really creepy like, ah, 
I think like, that's just him being creepy, though, rather than, you know. But the, and then he yeah. does mention to the maintenance, is like, oh, who I can deal with is that, is that daughter of theirs. I think, she, I think she understands me. Which you could interpret as him perving on her. But then when he meets Lydia, he's not, he's not pervy. He's very, like, it's a business transaction kind of thing. Like, he's like, I, I, you know, you can help me, I can help you. Yeah, I don't but, recall him ever trying to, like, mm-hmm. touch her or anything. It's not, it's not like, you know, Gina Davis, he's doing it left, right, and center. Like, looking up her skirt <laughs> and, you know, freaking <laughs> squeezing people's asses and stuff. Like, he is a full-on t- pervert. Never to Lydia. He never touches her inappropriately no. in any way. Mm-hmm. And, but this person at work was like, no, he is, he's, a, he's obsessed with a 15-year-old now first. But he's, he's dying to marry her. And so he's not dying to marry her. He wants the marriage to get out of the afterlife. So then when in this movie, he's like, yeah, he's thought about her for 35 years. I was like, I don't think that he would. Like, I, wa- I was torn on that because I had that initial reaction as well. Like, oh, oh okay. Because we've talked about that on our commentary. Mm. Um, but I, I, maybe I need to see it a second time. I've been thinking maybe maybe it's just meant to be kind of, you know, that that was his one chance to get out. He's lost it. Maybe he's kind of joking about loving her. And he's just sort of thinking about that moment more than anything. I think you might be onto something there. Because I think Beetlejuice as a character, he's like the ultimate, like, fake it till you make it kind of guy. Yeah. In that, mm, like, yeah. he, he just kind of bulldozes his way into things. And so even when they get, he makes a deal with the maintenance, even though they're very obviously like, we do not want anything to do with you. He's like, we made a deal. Like, like I, uh-huh. I, I want this deal to happen. You clearly want this deal to happen as well. I don't care about what you actually say. <laughs> and so then when he's like, um, and then all, all the people he has working for him, all the little shrunken head guys. Oh, I love that as well. The way he's got a little <laughs> business going and everything. Full of, yeah. The whole of like bio exorcism. Like, I love him taking calls. Like, oh, yeah, I'll kill the husband. I'll possess the wife. and yeah, It'll be great. <laughs> um, but like his right hand man called Bob. You know, his, um, num- his number one guy. His number one guy. Yeah. It has to be has to be a reference. has to be a he reference. He should have said, oh. you're my number one guy. He definitely should have. 100% should have said that. Um, but I think the thing with that, those guys are those shrunken head guys. He's clearly keeping prisoner. And they've got their mouths sewn <laughs> shut, so they can't object to anything. But he's <laughs> acting as if they're his friends. Because yeah. he's like, yeah, we all get on great, right, guys? I think that's his attitude as well. He's like, <laughs> oh, I was so close with Lydia. I was so close to getting out of here. If I could just talk to her, if I could just smooth her, we'd be totally fine. And I'll, I'll definitely get married to her and I'd definitely get out of the afterlife. Exactly. So, Plus time's different yeah. there. Maybe to him it doesn't feel like that. I can't remember what he says in the movie, to be honest. Maybe maybe it feels like it happened last week. It know? could be. It could be. But uh, Yeah. Mm. Well, and I think part of the – one of the, the counter arguments, because I'm with you, Niall, and, and re-watching the original this week in preparation and – you know, be able to more, com- you know, compare the two, mm. um, you know, you see like how, yeah, Beetlejuice is a guy, he's, he's a man of his word. He keeps up his side of the bargain, but in terms of like the creepiness, um, I also agree with you. Like it would have been creepy if now he, if in, in the sequel, if he's moved on and he's kind of like perving on Astrid mm. and he kind of wants, you know, once you know, like if he sees her in the netherworld and like, mm. Oh, here's my chance. Like, okay, that's the pervy. Beetlejuice, like if he just keeps moving on to, um, you know, the daughter, where it's like, no, no, he's still infatuated with Lydia, mm. and now mm. it's age appropriate. So, like, yeah, I don't think I, I you know, so I, I agree with you in terms of, um, yeah, Beetlejuice, not not such a bad guy after all. Yeah, you, you've won me over. Yeah, because I've always thought, well, yeah, you know, Beetlejuice, yeah. he's he's a sort of sex pest, and mm. he is yeah. sort of, but he's he's all talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think yeah. he also. It's another one of the things in the, the original movie is like when Juno distracts him by making like the um the for want of a better word the whorehouse appear. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's filled with like lady ghosts. He, yeah. he just doesn't question it. <laughs> He's no. just like, yeah. this is just magnificently appeared in front of me. And it's one of the best moments of the whole movie is him like dancing towards it and stuff because yeah. he's just so wrapped up. In it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love it. So oh, we good. should say, because uh, you were, you're, now you were talking about the the musical. So the, the tie-in or the, I don't know if, uh, you know, the kind of the, the, the plot line they borrowed in the musical. Um, so kind of the, the, the setup is similar in terms of the the Dietzes move into this house where the the previous owners are dead and um you know uh, Delia is Lydia's stepmother but so Lydia goes over to the netherworld to look for her mother mm. um similar and then in this so and then th- they borrowed that and then so in this it's Astrid going 
to look for her father. Oh, that's true. Um, but that's it's true. that 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 similar plot line. Mm. Uh, okay, okay, interesting. I did think there was a little bit though. Again, of Tim having a knock. Um, unless you want, because I'm assuming they want to do a third one. There seems to be a lot of setup for like, well, uh, you know, maybe. And you've got to call it Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Right? Well, of course, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> instead of three juice, which is obviously you know, it's right there. For you. <laughs> But uh, mm. I mean, this one should have been two beetle, two juice. <laughs> <laughs> but the, because that's such a, like, I believe, like the opening song in the musical is Lydia singing to her to her mother, and one of her big show stopping <laughs> numbers is called "Dead Mom." It's all about Lydia missing her mother. And then in this movie, at one point, they mentioned that Lydia's mother's actually alive. It's not Delia, yeah. but she's just like, I think uh, Delia mentioned something about her dead mother, and like. Lydia's like, my mother's alive and she's living in like, you know, San Francisco. Like, you you know that. And they're like, oh, come on, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. um, I love that. It feels like Tim was just like, I never said that her mother was dead. So I don't know where you're getting that from. But canonically, my Lydia's mother is alive. So screw that you, musical. <laughs> um, I love that he's like, no, no, no. Yeah, that's not my thing. This mm. is my thing. You've got to listen to me now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Tim Burton. God damn. He might be aware of the generation of people on TikTok and whatnot who are obsessed with the musical. And he's just like, yeah, that had nothing to do with me. I'm taking my I'm taking my toy right. back. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that's, what Beetlejuice That's fanfic. Is. That's not canon. Yeah. This is, you know, this is the, uh, the Burton verse Beetlejuice. But also, I will uh, steal your plot line about looking for a dead parent in the afterlife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, going back to something you said a, a minute ago, Sean. Um my initial worries before I saw the movie were I assumed the plot would be Beetlejuice wants to marry Astrid. I thought mm-hmm. that was because it's the yeah. easy way to write this film, right? He's back. Oh, now he wants to marry the daughter. Well, the new daughter again. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought, oh, God, that's what he's going to do, isn't it? And, <laughs> and I was the really happy the new that they did was just like, the new daughter with well, you sexy know, results. Because <laughs> technically in the last one, he was trying to marry the daughter. <laughs> <But> <laughs> now it's the daughter of the daughter. Hmm. I do. I, I love his interactions with Lydia in terms of like him building up to that because she finally calls on him, and he's like, "Well, you're something you could do for me," and she's like, oh, "What is it?" <laughs> and he goes into a little thing like, "Well, I got this ex-wife, and you know, it's kind of a pain in my ass. That you want me to marry you? Like, oh, would you? <laughs> like, I thought you'd never ask." <laughs> oh, I'll bringing her up again. Yeah. Oh my god, the flashback scene where you find out how they got married and stuff. I thought that was one of the best things in the entire oh, film. Was, uh, oh, yeah. All in Italian. <laughs> I'll, say, I, I'll say the... the I was, it's a good thing they did what they did with it because, again, uh, for what, like 35 years or however long it's been, like, Beetlejuice is like, you don't, you don't need to know how he died. There's, fa- there's fan theories about how, like, he was a bus driver that drowned or whatever, or he killed himself, and that's why he's... Because they say specifically... Oh, that's the thing. Put a note, in that, uh, put a pin in that. Actually, like in the first movie, oh. if you kill yourself, you become a civil servant. And then Astrid's <laughs> yeah. dad is working for the civil service. It's like, what is that trying to say? Like, oh, but then whoa, he, I didn't think about that. Oh but God. then he's also been chewed to death by piranhas, so it might be more like, well, he put himself in that situation, so he essentially killed himself. Plus, plus maybe, maybe the civil service also hire other people. It's just if you kill yourself, you have to be a civil servant. It could be. It could be. Or could be yeah, I'm or a the... civil servant. What's happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> it could be just like the the, uh, the bureaucracy of the afterlife is so monstrous that it's like, oh, I, I, but I got eaten to death by piranhas. They're like, yeah, but you shouldn't have been there. So uh, yeah, yeah, that was yourself. a piranha's home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you, yeah, if effectively, if you just kill yourself with bad decisions. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. The same. But I, I, I kind of took it the way I think the way you did, John. It's just you know you've got. You've got all the afterlife. You get bored. You're like, eh, it's yeah. a job. It's something to do. Mm. So it's like, yeah. So every every suicide becomes a civil servant, but not every civil servant, you know, is, yeah. is a suicide. Agreed. Juno seemed to be a civil servant, and she seems like she was. A, did she smoke herself to death? And they're like, yeah, well, yeah, you killed yourself because you, you took off the goddamn cigarettes. Yeah. So that's possible. somebody tell uh, somebody tell David Lynch. Yeah, oh. just, like, wanna, you're gonna be a, a civil servant too, oh, soon. Uh, too soon. Although I did, I will say I I I didn't catch this in in viewing, but I looked it up. I was kind of doing some trivia research for the for the podcast, and uh, there's a uh, I guess on uh, one of the newspapers that Beetlejuice is reading in his office. There's a headline: "Workers wrongly assigned suicide at death." Oh, so that might explain it. That just some 
some people are just getting wrongly classified in the afterlife. Oh, oh that explains plane. it right there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I got. The good, good thing you you did your uh, perusing yeah. there, Sean. I, should, I did. I did one little bit of research. Yeah, because I guess you know the the question. I think a lot of people had that question of like, why is Richard um, kind of stamping passports? Yeah. Yeah. But, but it um, was, uh, but, as you were saying, it was nice to find out Beetlejuice's background and it not ruin the character because you're like, oh, he was he was a grave oh, yeah, robber. Yeah. You're like, yeah. Yeah, but when they come yeah. out, it was like, yeah, he was during the plague. He was a grave robber, yeah. and then he hooked. Well, up. that's a callback because didn't he say when he when he when he's like going over his um, qualifications with yeah. um, mm. with Adam and Barbara, he's like, um, yeah, you know, I had a pretty good time in the in the you know during the plague. Yeah, he did say that. Yeah, like, oh, he had a good time grave robbing. Yeah, it's yeah. quite clever the way in this they do that. Uh, some people might not like it, but the way they yeah. take random throwaway gags, right. And turn it into a like even him having an ex-wife. That's a random throwaway gag in the first one when he's got he pulls out the ring for the wedding and uh, it's on a finger. Yeah, it's, it's and he's like, oh, nothing, she to, meant me, nothing to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the the finger ring. Oh. <laughs> but I love it. The- it was nice. Yeah, because and you mentioned you know the 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 concern that this would just be they kind of just retread the entire plot from the first film and and you know have mm. him trying to marry Astrid. I like, like they they did a good balance where it's not. Um, you know, it's not just a remake of the first, and certainly we've seen sequels that oh, yeah. that do that you oh, know, too much. Yeah. <laughs> but there is enough. There's enough little Easter eggs and callbacks and references. So I thought that is great stuff. It probably helps that I saw this just after watching Alien Romulus, which was the opposite <laughs> of what we're saying. <laughs> it was, that was like, oh, remember Alien? Yeah, remember Aliens? <laughs> and the most disappointing part of that is that like the first like three quarters of it aren't really like that, and then the last quarter is just like. Yeah. Here's everything you remember about Alien. <laughs> and you're just like, but you were doing so well. You don't have to do this. Like, what the hell? Well, um, I, I, um, but I, I will say though, just before we, uh, just before we move on from, uh, Beetlejuice's death though, because again, that was a, a nice touch to Tim. He won me over because I was like, I don't need to know how he died. You're, he's, he's got Mystique. He's had Mystique yeah. for all this time. And then to show you how it's done, but how are we going to do it? It's going to turn into a Mario Bava movie. Yeah. <laughs> For like yeah. five minutes, he's gonna be inexplicably speaking Italian. It's not Michael Keaton speak. It's like a different guy speaking Italian. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, oh, okay. Again, that sense of fun where I was just like, oh, why would I care? We'll find out about how he died. Is it? Like, yeah. Well, this is fun. Yeah, I'm enjoying what you're laying down here. I like Mario Bava. I know that everyone here watching this probably like you know enjoys that kind of stuff too. But it's just like, yeah, throw him back to that different style of filmmaking. <laughs> And then showing you, like, how did Beetlejuice die? He was uh, grave robbing during the plague, and he got the hots for a lady. <laughs> and it turned out that they really screwed him over. It's like, no, oh, yeah, okay, that works. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, that. I'll take that. It fits. It totally fits. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. And I love the way she's insisting that they're sort of they're still a couple. And it's like, no, you were a couple for, like, a night. <laughs> you know? Well, that's the thing, too. I've seen some people interpret it as being, like um, – Oh, uh, the message in the movie is that like all men are scumbags, and all these all these women have been sort of victimized by them. But well, then, I, no, hang on. I mean, I I agree that that happens far too much in real life. But in this case, she's the evil one. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. It's like well, you watch the movie. It's like yeah, that happens. But also, Beetlejuice himself is the victim of his wife. Like she she killed him, and then yeah. he killed her. But like, and then she's coming. Well, I, actually, I don't get what she's coming for. Is the thing? I think it's just to just to cut him up or kill him somehow you know because you can kill people like a second death can't you as they... but then, well, she, she can mm-hmm. suck his soul out yeah but she was but maybe she just wants closure on that but then why did she marry him in the first place if all she wanted was to suck out his soul which she can do to anyone and then we she's might coming have for to him. rewatch it for that maybe there's an explanation with the ritual she's doing or something maybe she needs a i don't know maybe yeah, it's the... some sort of a level of sacrifice you need to yeah make. well help her it's attain. like a, a black it's like a Black Widow thing mm. where it's, you know, she wants to kill her mate. Yeah, because yeah, she, she goes and specifically takes a, a dress from the dry cleaners, a wedding dress, and turns it black because he's like, yep, I'm going off. I'm going to get I'm, – I'm going to get hitched to Beetlejuice again? Because uh, uh, at the end when, he, when she shows up and it's the incredibly disappointingly brief scene where he just instantly goes like, hey – what about I'm no good for you what about this guy and then like he puts like a I heart Dolores t-shirt on <laughs> that's great Justin <laughs> Drew and Rory yeah. and then but she has a moment of been like huh maybe yeah so you're kind of like is she coming because like oh I, I you are my betrothed so we should be together or is she just coming to suck his soul out like I, I think it's getting a kind of ironic revenge like she's doing the wedding dress maybe to 
it just adds salt to the wound kind of situation, maybe. He's like, I'm a corpse bride of oh, some sort. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, oh my god. He's he can't help himself, this guy. <laughs> well, I saw um, I saw a behind the scenes thing, and I think it was Winona who said, um, like, this movie is it's a love letter to the works of Tim Burton. Hmm. And it, it made mm. me think of, you know, the way we say that about Twin Peaks The Return. It's a love letter to David Lynch. So maybe that is a reference. Maybe that is what he's going for. And he's putting everything in this. Like, this, is, be, this yeah. is my life's work. Kind of. Maybe go through, because we've already spotted references to both Batman 89 and the, the like Bob mm. and the Penguin stuff. It could be if you go through, it's like, oh, there's a little thing from Mars Attacks. There's a thing from Sleepy Hollow. There's a, uh-huh. you know, it could be he's, he's densely layered in Easter egg upon Easter egg. But it's just yeah. as a kind of... Um, yeah, I picked up the um, well reference to Charlie and the Charlotte fa- Char- Charlie and the Chocolate Factory um, when Beetlejuice he blows up like Violet Beauregard. Oh yeah, that's oh, right. I might yeah. see. Yeah, mm. yeah. I was I, I wasn't. Yeah, the, I think maybe it's in the climax where like yeah, uh, Dolores and Rory are taken out way too easily, and then Beetlejuice himself is sort of like yeah, he, for some reason he blows up. And I was like, <laughs> I was looking really forward to seeing how you're going to get rid of him this time. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> like, it's a, yeah. bit of a, a bit of a letdown. But to be fair, the buildup of that scene was magnificent. I was about to say, you can't fault it. You can't it, fault that buildup. I'm loving, if, oh. if this film has done nothing else, it is at last brought uh, MacArthur Park back into the public conversation, <laughs> which is, yeah. uh, if the people aren't aware of what MacArthur Park is, Richard Harris, the actor Richard Harris, back in the 70s, uh, made an album. And one of the, <laughs> <laughs> one of the songs on it is a seven-minute epic. Masterpiece. Uh, called MacArthur Park, which is the like, well, and I didn't get, I remember for years, I just didn't really know what it was, because like the Simpsons riff on MacArthur Park quite a bit. Like, yeah. They had Alfred's, not Alfred, uh, Apu's daughter singing it at one point. I know his daughter, but his, like his niece, I guess. I, just, I can't remember. Just like the, I remember the gag. I don't remember who it was. Yeah, yeah. you see like the school talent show and then it's him and Sanjay. And you hear her up on stage going, and it's like it's a reference to, I think the, the joke is that she's just playing like bongos and singing MacArthur Park. And it's supposed to be torture for everybody. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah, Jeff Goldblum's character and it's called MacArthur Parker and things like that. Um yeah, it's it's just the most nonsensical gibberish of a song about like again like the chorus. It's, it's it's so perfect, and I wonder like it kind of threw me off because in the beginning, is it like I think just a little bit maybe just before or just after like the Danny Elfman, you know Beetlejuice theme. There's a little bit of the Donna Summers version of this song mm. and i'm like that's that's kind of a weird choice and then it comes back at the end and i got it, like i've you know i've known the song probably my whole life i mean it, it came out like the R- richard harris was what 71 mm. i think was like the year yeah. i'm born so like i've you know i've heard this song and you were born covers. in the year I mean, of macarthur park <laughs> <laughs> i was born i i am one macarthur park's age old yeah it, um, it affected your uh, development <laughs> and the i mean the lyrics don't make any sense like someone left a cake out in the rain yeah and uh, you know all, it, it doesn't make the any sense and then i like, icing melting down. like the yeah, whole song it's, down. A, it's a seven minute song about a cake melting and the guy yeah. been upset because he doesn't have the recipe to make the cake yeah again. <laughs> I don't think that I can take it because it took so long to bake it and I'll never have that recipe again, which makes no sense because if you have the recipe, you just you just make it again. You just you have the recipe. You can repeat it. Maybe like watching his his notebook out in the rain as well. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But then I figured out, oh, like watching this film, I'm like, oh, it's about relationships. It's like that, you know, the chemistry between people. That's the recipe. The, you know, the specific that's the recipe isn't. You know, it's not a literal recipe. It's the combination of me and this other person and the relationship. And that's what I can't recreate. Mm. Like I like through this film, I got, oh, that's what this song is about. Yeah. Like so it was, I think, like the perfect choice. It's on the surface, like a lot of things in Beetlejuice and, and Tim Burton as a whole, like all his works, like on the surface, it just seems like, oh, this is just random fun. It's kind of nonsense. But like. I think there there is a a theme there. There is a story. Yeah, because I mean, he's got um, you know going on underneath. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it gets all the people. They're all interconnected, yeah. like Astrid and Delia and Lydia and be like they're all people who. And then yeah. of course Rory. Should, so no, no, that's that's like it's a yeah. I think you're bang on there, Sean. Yeah. Uh, well, and then just the license 
of what what you allow the actors to do. And this was the same in the you know the Deo scene, the you know um, the the dinner scene in the first one when Beetlejuice, or I guess I think I guess it's Adam and Barbara at that point that you know you know put, possesses the people and make them dance. Like yeah. the actors can just do go overboard because it's it's not the character. They're being possessed and they're forced to do this. Yeah. And it's so fun. It's so over the top. And I want to, I got to give a shout out to the, um, the priest to, to burn Gornum. Oh yeah. Who is, who I had to look up. I don't, he's like, for me, he's like, he's that guy. Like you, I instantly recognize him from, from stuff um... he's done, but I didn't know the name father plays father Damien. Like his, he only gets a couple lines in the song, but he just hits it perfectly. Oh, he, he's he, so good. He's a great, cause it was at the uh, Pacific Rim. I know he has a big part in. It's him and Charlie Day yeah. are like are kind of like a double oh, act in yeah. it, and he's in the, right, he's right. in the Dark Knight Rises actually. Uh, yeah, Dark Knight uh, Rises, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah he <laughs> and also too calling him Father Damien is like Damien, like the well, omen. Damien, yeah. yeah, like the Omen. Um, well, no, he's he's amazing because because he's just a cliched, stereotypical Irish priest, and he just comes out with gibberish all the time. <laughs> That's a great bit at the start where he's just like, he's talking to Delia and he's like, well, let the Lord bless and favor now and go down in his spirit. And she just looks at him and goes like, what? Because <laughs> like, he's just like whole cinema, like, everybody started laughing at that. Yeah. Point. Oh no, he's fantastic. Yeah. Like, Burn Gorman, oh, he has a great, great, uh, great presence. And then, yeah, that whole sequence, the fact that like, it th- thematically ties in, like you're saying, Sean, but also, we have the excuse now for Beetlejuice's wedding cake to be this green, moldy, overflowing, melting kind of oh, yeah. monstrosity. Yes. Uh, green icing flowing down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he gets as well, like a little thing. It has to be deliberate where he's making everybody dance. And of course, Jenna Ortega gets a little moment of doing a very distinctive little jittery dance. And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah. what, Tim Burton, what did he do most recently? Wednesday with Jenna Ortega. What was the big thing that everyone remembered from Wednesday? The was, dance. Was the dance the that dance. they did. So I feel that he was like, it is a celebration. It's like, yeah, me and Jenna doing a little weird dance again. It's all, and I, I, uh, I, that was one of my favorite moments as, uh, as well, uh, Sean, because in our commentary, um, as I think I've mentioned on the show several times, one of my favorite moments of any film ever is literally the opening 30 seconds of Beetlejuice, where it's mm. the Geffen logo, and it has that little creepy, mm. delete, 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 and then you just hear Danny Elfman's, and it builds up into that, you know, dun dun, dun dun, and you get the the glowing writing, and then you just get Beetlejuice, and it's just it goes into the main theme. And it's like it's so so good. So I was just hoping, like, if they can recreate something like that, uh, and then going in and just been like, yeah, you, now you got a Warner Brothers logo. It was like okay, but then the Geffen logo shows up again, mm. and then yeah, you get Donna Summer, and it's like oh never, oh no, and then just beautiful, dun dun. I was like, oh, we're back. It's the writing. It's all here again. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it really goes into like they recreate the opening of the original, but it's, like, kinda, it's much more obviously, it seems this it's not the model. It's the actual town and it's a really stormy night. But then it goes up mm-hmm. through the window into Lydia's show. And you're like, is this the intro to the show? <laughs> or is this oh, coincidental? Yeah. Like, what, what's happening here? Because she, she's not filming it in the house. So I don't know what was. Yeah, but um and I, yeah, I love that too. That even again, um, okay, maybe that's, that's a little reference to Ed Wood because Lydia's hosting a. It's like Peter Venkman in Ghostbusters too. Hundred like, percent, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ghost House, yeah. Ghost House, but um, I think what's the <laughs> oh, I think the original title of Beetlejuice was going to be House Ghosts. So there it you was, go. Um, yeah, yeah, it was House Ghosts, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So there goes a little nod there, but she's sitting in the big old flowing black dress and looks very a bit Elvira ish, but also a bit vampire vampire ish. Mm-hmm. And of course, Vampira was in Ed Wood, the, the film, right. played oh, by Lisa Murray. So maybe it's supposed to be a little like he's hearkening back to that type of show. Um, but uh, well, yeah. And then when they go to watch, they kind of they go to watch a clip, and it's on like a, a television out of the fifties. Yeah, that's on the set there to show the the clip at and the, why else at the Welch's it house. Yeah. yeah, and also really well, reminded you... me of um, it won't track with U.S. audiences, but it was very most haunted. Oh, oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a ghost hunting show in the UK um, with a guy, well, hosted by a lady called Yvette Fielding, who was just terrified every episode, which is going around <laughs> in jitters. 
<laughs> so much of that night cam of her just like freaking out in houses. And then there was a guy in it who's himself passed on and somehow has not come back from the dead to tell people about it. Strange. Um, but this guy, Derek Akora, who is a psychic medium, a scouse psychic medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, who would always go in and get taken over by the ghosts of the house. Uh, and yet somehow, even though all the ghosts were speaking through them, they were all Scouse ghosts as well. <laughs> even if they died in like London in 1880. It's <laughs> like, oh. using his vocal cords now. Come on. <laughs> using his, I don't think your vocal cords have nothing to do with your accent. <laughs> uh, Although you, you mentioning the way that uh, Lydia looked there, Again, in the trailers, if you remember me saying to you, Niall, off, off mic, in the trailers, I instantly was like, why the hell has she got the same hair? Mm. In the finished movie, I think it made sense to me because mm. she's famous for this incident with the ghost or whatever. It's become, her, that's her look. Yeah. She mm. has to, it's like a character she has to do. I like that you see uh, when they're going through the photo book, you see f- photographs of Winona Ryder in the 90s and she's got different hair and stuff. Like, it's kind of like, oh, she didn't maintain yeah. this the entire time. It's exactly. very clearly she's like... She's put it on as part of the image. Yeah. yeah. I, I would have loved to right. seen if she takes it off, it's a wig. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I also just love seeing... Uh, one of my the big highlights of this whole thing coming out for me is the fact that uh, for the first time in so long, uh, probably about like 20 years... We're getting a lot of Winona Ryder just out, like, talking. Yeah. Because she doesn't, Mm -hmm. you know, Stranger Things, she's there and she promotes it a bit. But, like, they're just talking about Stranger Things stuff. But now it's been, it's really been, like, she's over talking to GQ about all the looks she had and all her films. I watched a 45-minute interview with her just sitting riffing with a guy. And Mm -hmm. just, like, they weren't talking about, they were talking about, like, the age of innocence and stuff. They were really getting deep into her career. And she it just reminds you, like, because everyone, you know, like, I'm, I'm assuming we all love Winona, and she's obviously beautiful oh, yes. and iconic oh, yeah. for various reasons. But then when you remember when you see her talking, she's such a genuinely lovely person. You just kind of want like, yeah. I wish I was friends with Winona Ryder. She seems like she's like, she's really, really into cinema. She really like, you see her out promoting her, her favorite films and they'll ask her about things like, what's your four favorite films? And it's always like Matwan. And down by law, <laughs> all oh. these like real deep cuts and stuff. Oh, well, this uh, would explain the rumors that she has. A, a, uh, she really doesn't like um, Millie Bobby Brown. Did you oh. hear about this? Oh, it's because yeah, the, the Millie Bobby Brown. They beefing. <laughs> but yeah, the, Millie the, Bobby Brown apparently said that she doesn't really like movies or or TV. She doesn't watch anything. She doesn't like it. And then there was an interview with Winona where she was like saying, "I think anyone in this business should should." care they should watch it and it's yeah. like whoa okay this seems oh. pointed <laughs> yeah, but she, was, she doesn't strike me as the type who would have beef though she'd be like oh well that's that's her you know i, I think well, people should yeah. do this but like but then of course she could say that in that tone and then the tabloids would be like what yes. writer blasts <laughs> <laughs> it's all actors who don't watch movies <laughs> say what as well watching interviews with her for this um if i would just watch one before we uh, got on the mics and i mean this in the best way she comes across like um she's you know, got like anxiety problems. Yeah. And she might be like neurodivergent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I related. I was like, oh, she's like me. Just hot. <laughs> <laughs> but she grew up in sort of like, yeah, because it wasn't her, she grew up on a kind of like a, not, a, not, not within a cult, but like I know her parents knew Timothy Leary. Uh, and oh, right, she grew up right. in kind of yeah. communes, like little communes and stuff. And like, I think her, her upbringing was very, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if she had a, a so strange upbringing and then also was neurodivergent. And that sort yeah. of created uh, the legend that is Winona Ryder. Um, but yeah, I'm I just, could, so, I could just so... see it in the way she was talking to people and holding herself. I was like, this is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think again get to just see like the, the pairings of, like Jenna Ortega and uh, Catherine O'Hara have been just out doing interviews together and just seem to really <laughs> love being together. They yeah. have a, they've struck up a genuine friendship and stuff. And it's, um, yeah, I think so much of like the, the joy of all this has been like seeing Mickey Keats back out. Like he clearly loved playing the part. He also, it's one of the best guys slipping back into a role I think I've ever seen. Like yeah. Harrison Ford can do it with Indy, kind of. But a lot of the time when you have a huge break, people will come back as a character michael keaton coming back as batman where you're like he's in the suit but i don't yeah, know but he wasn't batman that wasn't the batman we we knew and a lot of times people come back and it's just like yeah it's not quite the same him is step, stepping in the same age michael goff was when he first played alfred 73 years old wow. michael keaton is putting back on the makeup 
doesn't look a day older, doesn't look doesn't look different at no. all. And, just and I know sweats. it's makeup and stuff, but still, through makeup, you can still see aging. He looks the same. He looks the same. And he's he's got, he's got a move. Like we've seen actors kind of play younger with with cgi and i won't name names but um <laughs> you know some really good actors and really good directors have done a really bad job of it and you yes. say like okay you know the makeup and the suit you know you can make them look like beetlejuice but he's got to move like beetlejuice he's got to you know yeah. be the character and he does it and it doesn't look like it doesn't look like an old man trying to act like he died young a hundred percent no you're right because uh, we've talked about this on the podcast before what was it now there's that movie was the, the DH was it De Niro? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, that was the Irishman. The Irishman, where it's yeah. like him, <laughs> him trying to beat up a guy, and it just looks like he—he's supposed to be De Niro, like thirty, beating up a dude. And it's just like a clearly eighty-year-old man, <laughs> yeah, barely walk, trying to walk. kick this guy. It's like yeah. looks terrible. But no, look, Mickey Keats is like, oh, he's he's still got the he's still got yeah. the swagger. Well, for it. such yeah. a you know a, a kinetic, high-energy character that Beetlejuice is, and like I never like not once throughout the film did I think about the age of the actor like he totally no, no, disappears no. into the character yeah none of that stuff which you would get with Indy, particularly in crystal skull i think they, they didn't mm-hmm. go into it in the, in the latest one because i think people were fed up with it it was like oh, stop stop talking about how old he is we know how old he is yeah, we, um, we get it that was the joke in the last one yeah but this is just like no it's just it's, he's he's he has beetlejuice has an age <laughs> he's exactly the same as he always was so why would michael mm-hmm. keaton's age be a, be an issue here um mm-hmm. whereas in in the flash we noted that, like, yeah, they've CGI'd him jumping around and doing all this stuff. And it's like, but his Batman didn't do that. That's not – you're making this look stupid now, you know? That's why you've got to get the tone right and things, and they do it mm-hmm. here. I say, to me, this is the best resurrection of a franchise since they did Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. No, because, is... As in – and I'm not okay. like – you know, I love my Star Wars and stuff. But I think this this gets it but also does something different with it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Force Awakens, it's great, but it's it's kind of the first movie again. You yeah. know? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's a Death Star, but it's bigger. It's a planet. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I still guess maybe this one's against this. We're, we're getting married, but it's bigger. <laughs> well, you could, you could say that, but I think all the other stuff around it, that, you know, it's it's it gets it. It gets what it's doing, and it isn't just callbacks. There's callbacks, but there's a few of them, and they're done well. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's, mm-hmm. it's very rarely. I mean, the only one you might be able to criticize is when he does the crazy thing with the face. That you know. But even then, it's like a split second. So. Yeah, and we don't know that he's showing the same thing that he did exactly before. Exactly. It could be a completely. And then different... he does the thing where his, all of his guts come out, and it's like what was it, like worms or snakes. Yeah, or yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, oh, but oh, that's a great part. I love that. So, oh, you know, let's spill our guts. I'll go yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um. Yeah, the, the, just uh, at the point now though, just get like little random tidbits I wanted to get into. That's things that are random little things that I love in it. It's like um, well, they have a whole recurring thing about uh, Astrid's dressed up as Marie, uh, Marie Curie. Marie Curie, and of course, Which people ties into our show. <laughs> yeah, of course, because people might uh, people listening to our tie-in Patreon show VHS Capades might recall that we recently talked about uh, Marie Curie. <laughs> Uh, on our episode of Young Einstein with Yahoo Sirius, where <laughs> Marie Curie was actually a main character in that, in that movie. Um, and then the whole the lie that the Simpsons told me where they're like, oh, the Curies discovered radium and then they died of radiation poisoning. And you find out her husband got trampled by a horse. Like, that's how he died. <laughs> he didn't die of radiation poisoning. Uh, and then she did, but like way years later. It's like... The, the Astor's there. It's like, oh, it's her after the radiation poisoning. It's like she died at like seventy. Like <laughs> she had been radiation poisoned for a long, long time. But like it was years later, and they're like, I guess we can tie this to the radiation. But like, it's not as if no, you know, she died inside long before. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird too because you always be like, oh, she had this big, big chunks of radium that they just like were examining in bed and just put them on the bedside table. It's just radioactive material <laughs> just sitting beside <laughs> them in bed. to the point now where it's like, oh yeah, you can go see like their personal libraries, but you can't go in because it's still radioactive <laughs> because the house is freaking covered in this stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the little uh, points like um, Beetlejuice does get to say the F word once. Once uh, yeah. I have a note on that because then they bleep it. Yeah, they bleep it the, the second only, time. Yeah, the second time, <laughs> which I thought was a great gag. Yeah, because uh, they yeah. know that we know they're given one. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and um, 
Yeah, the, the, also the, the question then, because that's him literally sending, what's his name, Jeremy? The, Je- yeah, sending yeah. Jeremy to hell. Send it so, to hell. Yeah, so we death do find that oh, it's not just the, the netherworld. It's like, no, there's netherworld. And then presumably the Maitlands have gone to heaven. We guess. Yeah, I, th- I think this netherworld's right. like a kind of, well, it's like a waiting room, as you said, isn't it? It's like you, you stay there until things are sorted out. It could be a million years, I guess. Yeah, this is the waiting room. Some yeah. of your friends are you. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I don't know many people will get what I was going for. There. Hey, we talk about these things all the time. They'll get it. <laughs> I guess we, I'm, I'm just trying to think of other little, there's so many just little moments in it. Now. I was just like, this is, yeah, this, well, nearly, nearly everything with Delia. Catherine O'Hara is just such a delight in general. And then just like, um, just the fact that like, yeah, as part of her pretentious art piece, <laughs> she... <laughs> She ended up buying like asps or whatever. Asps, <laughs> very dangerous. Yeah. Um, oh. And uh, it turns out, like, yeah, <laughs> they weren't defanged at all. She just said. And then her first thing is just like, make sure that you get a refund. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's such a it's such a her way to die. Yes. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yes. It's so stupid. It's fantastic. Because initially, though, I was a bit sad. I was like, oh, she's dead. Oh. Yeah. But she she foreshadows it in the first one. She you know she you know her. Her art is dangerous. Oh yeah, <laughs> she says of like, yeah. So yeah, she dies for her art, and I thought it was sweet. Like the one, I I I did think there was too much with Charles, but mm. I did like at the end, and I think you know it kind of paid off where they're reunited in the mm. netherworld, and I guess they're yeah. getting you know, get on the the soul train together. So I thought that was sweet. I think you could do okay. it and have just one scene of Charles wandering out of the waiting room at the big yeah. th- thirty seconds. 10 seconds yeah. and then at the very end just have that there and it'd be like oh that was a little thing with a little point we put up there and at but the I end, would miss all the yeah. funny bits of blood shooting out of his stumpy body <laughs> oh, yeah. great. Like, they <laughs> get another they? M- amazing moment of him coming into the waiting room sitting down the blood is spreading up but he's next to a surfer who's had his bottom <laughs> chopped off yeah. and the guy's just like hey man and hey, gives man. him like a little hang 10 sign it's like, yeah. what... That's, I was just about to mention that yeah this guy's missing the bottom half Charlie's missing the, the top half <laughs> but I thought they were going to put them together and that was going to be Charles' new top half <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm glad they didn't do that because yeah. that'd, that'd be a bit strange. That'd be but... a bit uh, Attack right. of the Clones, really, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Die, but, like, but, but Catherine O'Hara is, I mean, is just a wonder and a gift. And whatever she's in, go see it because she's always great. And then, mm, you definitely. know, and then in this, uh, yeah, she, she's she's yeah. wonderful. Any, yeah, all the all the scenes with with Delia are, yeah. are wonderful. I love might... this a little again though because he comes through on his deal with her as well like Delia's like looking for help in the afterlife and she's like oh god Beetlejuice Beetlejuice and then he just instantly appears but I love that when she sees him she just gives a little like ew (laughs) because she's just (laughs) like and she doesn't seem all that like because you know Delia she got she got done by Beetlejuice in the first one like Mm -hmm. got crushed by her own sculpture like literally grabbed her and like forced her top hat down on her head and like held her in place and stuff but she doesn't seem like when she see like I love her vibe is more like she might barely remember who Beetlejuice is because she's just yeah. in her. She's in her own little world. So like when, yeah. uh, when Lydia shows her the flyer, she's just like, ugh, like oh that yeah, guy, okay. <laughs> like oh that yeah. thing that happened years ago. But again, I've seen people say that um, they interpret things as if Lydia has been traumatized by the events of the first movie. Like that's why she keeps oh, seeing okay. him and what she. Uh, and I feel his presence, but I didn't get that vibe either. Like I feel like Lydia. No, doesn't she say that there was a long time where she didn't like? He's like she's only just starting to sort of see him. At least. It feels like she's yeah, only recently yeah. started to see him. She says like, and again, it's been thirty five years. She's like, oh, sometimes I felt I felt his presence as if he's been watching me, but you know, but nothing for too long. So I guess the, the vibe is like she lived a very happy life after the first movie. Yeah. And occasionally might have just thought about Beetlejuice mm-hmm. and been like, oh yeah, I kind of feel. Ugh. And then and, and you discover that she feels his his eyes when he looks at a picture yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um but then so to come out the other side and be just like oh, now she's panicked but then when she actually is confronted with him she doesn't like go to pieces she's just like all right I'm asshole. like even then when he does like the freakiest thing where like you know she goes in meets him he does like you know sews her mouth up and then gets her pregnant within a second the baby bursts out of her <laughs> and then <laughs> oh, seconds yeah. after that she's just like all right then head like <laughs> just kind of the, she doesn't seem all that traumatized vibe she's like you are such a pain in my ass you know that like, um oh, and i love the, then the, the fact that that comes back at the end for one of the like the fact they put in the music from carrie 
so you know because that music's beautiful in its own way but so eerie and then they were like uh, sitting there going this is the music from carrie what's going to happen and then they have astrid give birth to beetlejuice and he crawls up the wall like, onto the roof well, like it's train spotting like train spotting <laughs> It's so uh, messed up, that baby. Lands on her, and then she smiles. And she, she, she's like, oh. Like, oh, my baby. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I was like, for a moment, like, this can't be the end. Because they're playing the Carrie music, so and Carrie has the infamous fake-out ending, so uh, it has uh-huh. to be a fake-out. But like for a moment, we were like, is this actually happening at the end of this? Like, that would be freaking <laughs> insane. Like, just to be, it's like, yeah, baby Beetlejuice now. is just, And he's a ravenous little <laughs> <laughs> it goes around and gnaws people's legs and stuff. It's like, if you told me beforehand there's a scene with baby Beetlejuice, I would have gone, "Oh no, oh no!" But yeah. it's, it's one of the best bits. Yeah, it's like it's, it's like Baby Yoda. If you know yeah. about it beforehand, you're like, "Oh, this there's no way this can work." But if you uh-huh. you know if, you, if you're surprised by it, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah totally. A little baby totally beetle. But the people are saying like, "Oh, she's traumatized by the events of first," and then it's like, and then Be- Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice then impregnates her and gets her. She has his baby, and it's like. That's not a real like. That's like one of his bits. Like, there's like <laughs> yeah. he picks up the baby and just flings it away. Like it's gonna just disappear somewhere. He doesn't. Like, he doesn't care about that. The baby's not an actual child that they've had. It's like a little no. conjuring that he's done to be like, because that's what he. Do. He's a guy who can't stop doing bits. Like his whole thing yeah. is like, hey, baby. <laughs> yeah. But I do think I think on the trauma thing, I do think Lydia is traumatized, and not necessarily by the events of the first film. Although probably you know seeing what happens like. The Adam and Barbara during the exorcism was probably not easy to watch, but I think overall, you know, she comes away, she's got, you know, these two parental figures, she's kind of confronted her dark side. But I think in terms of the intervening years, I think of, well, I kind of think of the films that have happened between then and now and things like Sixth Sense Mm -hmm. and, you know, the power, like, it seems like she can't really control it at all in terms of when and who she sees. So I could see like, seeing ghosts and you know some of whom maybe not realize that they're dead and, and don't know what's going on like that probably has traumatized her yeah um, well she, she know, just, she's just, actively uh, taking pills to stop seeing yeah ghosts. to kind of yeah. to kind of turn it off yeah so not necessarily beetlejuice or that first encounter but just having you know having this ability for yeah the next 35 years and just goes constantly kind of barging mm. into your life that she, yeah she's got to medicate mm. so i, I like, do think a... there is some trauma there yeah, there's a, that's time. There is a theme about like because Beetlejuice's whole thing is that he he is a manipulator. He will like mm-hmm. move pieces in place to get what he wants, and but then Rory is that's all he's doing. Like Lydia wants to stop seeing ghosts. She's yeah. taking medication to stop it, and Rory comes in and throws the medication in the trash. Like and his whole thing is just like I want you to keep doing this show for me. <laughs> Basically, mm-hmm. I'm I'm maneuvering you into position for my best interest because yeah you need to keep seeing ghosts so we can keep making money and also you should marry me because much like people just like you should marry me because it'd be it would really help me out it yeah. turns out at the end rory's also oh you should really marry me because yeah i can make more money if i'm your husband rather than your manager or whatever uh-huh. and it's just like yeah, and then, scumbag but then dolores yeah. as well though so well she was she was clearly using beetlejuice for something like, there was a reason why she wanted to get married to him, and whether it be to suck out his soul or, again, not entirely too sure what the uh, the lore was supposed to be there. But, uh, yeah, I think, and of course, then even everything with Jeremy. It's just like his whole thing was like, oh, yeah, uh, you should come into the afterlife with me, get these passport stamps. Oh, actually, I was doing that. I was just manipulating you into place to get what I want rather than what mm-hmm. you want. So, yeah, there definitely is at least thematic through lines in terms of you know recurring themes and stuff basically don't uh, trust anybody yeah. don't trust <laughs> don't, don't trust the living yeah no. the beetlejuice in the first movie he was telling us that... <laughs> he did he, he warned you he warned you he warned all along yeah uh, but yeah yeah i don't know if there's many other things we haven't brought up about it uh but it was, you know danny elfman scores of the great as always i mean the only other bit i've got is music related um i did enjoy the way they brought back Deo for the funeral mm, mm, because again yeah. I was like oh how are you going to bring that back in a natural way it kind of made sense that they would sing it at his gravesite because maybe you know ever since that moment happened he's like got an attachment to this song and his family know that oh he, you know since that day yeah he listens to that song all the time <laughs> yeah it could be like it's it it actually kind of a, a sweet way to take it where it's like the Maitlands and the Dietzes ended up living together in Presumably, yeah. some sort of like kind of harmonious existence, um, 
And it could be that, like, yeah, they, 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 the Maitlands did that to scare the Dieters and it backfired and they just loved it. Yeah, exactly. And then it could because be they that, all seem to have a good time after the fact about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. They, like, at the end, you know, they're, they're, they're blasting Harry Belafonte oh, in the house and like, it cuts to Charles going like, oh, looks sounds like Lydia got an A in the math or whatever. And um, it could so be I think like, it's like a, it's a thing in the family now, that song. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I yeah. like that song. It reminds me of my friends, my, my friends, mm-hmm. the Maitlands who live in my house. It's like, yeah, it's a nice little sweet moment. That, you know, you think like, oh, they, they would play that at the Maitlands funeral. But it's like, no, Charles, he also grew to love Harry Belafonte because yeah, he associated, yeah. you know, his friends introduced it to him. And then he just had a, a lifetime appreciation for the for the character. Or for what the, a great the way singer. to bring it back because these movies that bring back songs and we're going to do a slow, sad version. It's so tired but this it gave it a purpose but then there is also the side where it's like a group of young boys singing a song in tribute <laughs> to a character played by jeffrey jones <laughs> yeah we, we, we've got to of, ignore that part now Come on. A bit of a, uh, <laughs> you boy. Right. in fact that behind the scenes documentary i was watching earlier anytime it showed a shot of um of his grave which is great shaped like a shark's fish <laughs> yeah shark fish. um but where anytime it showed it they'd blurred his face out wow really because his face is on it you know the picture and nope they wouldn't show it that would indicate that he probably is getting a paycheck for it being in the movie then and then the Maybe. people doing the behind the scenes documentary were like no we're not paying jeffrey jones for, for, for anything no you can get go get go screw himself but it's possible you might be onto it it's weird though that's it's such a uh it's such a weird it feels like a very delia kind of move though to be like he got eaten by a shark so we're shaping his grave like a shark. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet she made the gravestone. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because was, was she trying to do some ritual? By, not a ritual, but like a, an art piece performance by it as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's another great bit where she's like screaming. And they're like, what's wrong? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to catch her. What is it? The, the, my primal scream. Primal scream, scream yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I encourage you all to do it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, and then and then she's when she's like taping or filming herself, videoing herself at the grave, and she's like trying out lines like, "Oh, yeah. Expert, oh yeah, there's no expiry on grief or whatever the line." Yeah. I Incredible. think she comes out with it or something. Oh, that's good. And it takes out the that's dictaphone. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's maybe influenced Lydia a little bit more than Lydia would admit because Lydia's got a bit of that theatricality to her, in mm-hmm. even in the original as a kid, and she's writing a poem that you mentioned, a suicide oh, yeah. note. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. think they would get on more? <laughs> because Delia is a weird artist and Lydia is like a weird kid. She's yeah. a weird dramatic artist and she has a weird, you know, dramatic kid who's like sitting in a room with like a black wedding veil on writing about how she's going to throw herself off a bridge and stuff. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you think these two would get on more. <laughs> I think they come from different worlds though. Lydia probably sees her as a poser. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, it's all just, you know, it's all bullshit. <laughs> It, it's not real like my feeling <laughs> mm. it was, I think though they did a, the, the spin on her in the musical was quite good because Delia is like a new age hippie mm. and she's like a real like she's all into like healing stones and all this kind of like that works too yeah it's like one of the mm. one of the lines of one of her songs she has with Lydia is like I, I found my frequency crystals speak to me and then Lydia's like well, what are they saying buy more crystals and it's just like the kind of the, 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 the yuppie rich ass souls who think they're in touch with like the universe and healing and it's all just like it's all for it is all poser stuff it's just to make themselves look like i'm like a hippie like i'm an empath and you know and all this kind of crap and like that's the delia of the musical which is like it's a good it's a good take on her and it also kind of almost makes a little bit more sense that lydia will be like get the hell away from me (laughs) like rather than a weird art lady who's like um, um, yeah, I don't like you. <laughs> like maybe it's yeah. mostly because you're not my mother. That's why I don't like you. Kind of like, yeah. and that that happens between you know teenagers and their parents. But then you throw in like yeah the step parent thing. So I mean that's mm. yeah they're you know she the 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 teenager's not gonna see like how much they are like and appreciate it. Yeah, you know it's gonna take a while. And exactly. Tim Burton's obviously a guy who loves the the weird and the you know the strange and unusual. Strange. But the end, the message at the end though is that like no, Lydia needs a she needs a normie influence as well. She she you know the the, the yuppie dad and the artist mother because they just got their own things going on aren't paying. It's, it's the Maitlands with even though they themselves are strange because they're ghosts, they still are bringing balance to her life to be like no, she does need to get out. At like the end of this movie, she gets needs to get out into the light. And to live her life and to talk to people and to sort of, yeah. you know, which is a good yeah. thing. That that's kind of like throughout all of, well, not all of Tim Burton's movies, but you get like Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It's like, oh, he's a weirdo kid. Like, you know, and then at the end of the movie, everybody loves Pee Wee. They have a film celebrating his life. 
and that all yeah. the people he's encountered through on they all show up to support Pee Wee. Batman hated at the beginning because like oh six foot back bat attacking Gotham City. Commissioner Gordon's after him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the end of the movie, he gave us a signal, and everyone loves Batman. He's the hero of Gotham and stuff. Um, and like yeah, even the end of like Mars attacks and stuff too. Like all Lucas Haas and all the kind of outcasts are the ones that kind of come together, and they're the ones who survive everything. Yeah. Um, well, it's certainly like, something like uh, Edward Scissorhands. Well, yeah. though Edward Scissorhands kind of bucks the trend then because it's the end of that's so just like, yeah, he he just had to like. F- off back to back up that house because it didn't, didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. well, I just I, I I hate to change the subject, but it's, it's to keep. But you you brought it up. You brought up Pee Wee. Hmm? Is Pee Wee dead? Is that fine? I just it just and I and I I I talked about it on, on my podcast next scene podcast at nextscenepod.com and next scene pod on social media. Um, I mean we 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 talked in depth about uh, Pee Wee's Great Adventure, but it just popped into my head. Is Pee Wee dead? Is that his life flashing before his eyes? And that's why it's all the people oh. he's met along the way in his journey. Is ah. that the Pee Wee afterlife? You know, seeing oh, the movie wow. of his of his life? Yeah. That's sad. That's oh. a little bit sad too that like that Paul Rubus is you know, of course tragically passed on. You think would, Tim would have put in a little yeah. nod to him in here though, just to be like, or maybe maybe he did. Maybe it's it's hidden in there somewhere. But yeah. we've got to do a second comb through of this then. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. In many ways, too, I would say like you could interpret Bob as been the ghost of, of the afterworld ghost of uh, Bob the Goon. That's Why what not? happened to him. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I guess it's a wig Beetlejuice puts on him, but he does have similar hair. You do see him when, <laughs> when he's in the Beetlejuice outfit. He's got the same kind of Tracy Walterish. And I, I love that's a that's an unsaid detail that like we can just infer from the character and the way he works is that the end of the first movie, Beetlejuice got sat next to that witch doctor guy who shrunk heads. Yeah, shrunk his head, and then what he probably did was, oh, I like that idea. He probably swiped the the bag of sand or whatever that the guy had while he was. Oh, sat he definitely next didn't like hire the guy. No, he stole it. No, yeah. no, he probably like yeah. lifted that off him while he wasn't looking. Uh, yeah, and then since he's like, oh, this is a way to get like, how am I going to get interns? How am I going to get people to work for me? <laughs> oh, well, there's like, yeah, I've yeah. got that stuff. I'll just sprinkle this on people's heads, and then like, they're so mind. yeah, I'll so, be a part of my family. <laughs> and that was a that, that was a great visual where, and again, because it was done practically, you could tell it's people in suits. Mm. Where yeah, when yeah. the the hole is blown in the wall and they all get out and it's just all these guys with little tiny heads, like a like a sea of David Burns going down yeah. the street, and they're all just like running down everywhere, just like in a panic and like freaking out the trick or treaters. And I remember watching that, and like this is great. <laughs> this is yeah. the visual I'm going to remember is all those guys running down those stairs and out the front door. Because was- this is this is the thing I said it at the start. I'll say it again. Yeah, you can nitpick some things. You can. But I don't care. I was sat there smiling the whole time. Mm-hmm. Didn't stop. Mm-hmm. So screw it. It was fun from second one till the very end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a question. I have a theory. I want to get your take on it. So why why doesn't Lydia see Richard's ghost? That that is a I I did grapple with that actually because it's brought up that like yeah the reason Astrid is falling out with her um, is because. Oh, she can see all these ghosts, but she can't see my father. Right. And Lydia's just like, I've been trying. And then when they meet up, it's like, he's like, yeah, I, ch- I check in on you all the time. And it's like, but why can't she see him? Like, what's going on? I, I assumed that um, it's like she's she's sort of too close and she doesn't want to see him that way. Mm. Oh, and that's okay. why she, it's almost like she chose not to. I think she could, literally, but I think she shut herself off to it. Like, no, 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 I can't. That's too painful. Because, yeah. yeah, too painful. She can't deal with it. It's She's she's blocking. Even if she can't consciously control her powers, like subconsciously, it's just that yeah. block. Mm. That's, that's how I interpret okay. it. But it doesn't explain that, to be fair. Yeah. So I thought it might be related to, like, his classification that he's stuck working civil service. So oh, he does, you know, so yeah. he can't go visit her. But then, like you said, he has that line where he says, oh, I'm... I'm keeping an eye on you. So yeah. I don't really know the answer. So they, they had the solution to the problem right yeah. in with what you said, Sean. And then like, he's like, yeah, I'm freaking tied to my desk. I can't I can't get away. That's why you haven't seen me. Yeah. Yeah. That would be and funny as well. It'd be quite a good gag. Yeah. And that's one of the things that kind of, that disappointed me is when the, that reunion, like obviously he, we get more of a connection between Richard and Astrid. Like, oh, I get you know, reunited with my daughter. Um, and I do think there is a reference that they were – 
Lydia says something like, oh, like the the marriage went bad or they were split up before he died. Hmm. But I still think they would have had more of a reunion. Yeah. Like yeah. there would have been more emotion between them. Because she, um, she, she sp- yeah. speaks fondly of him in memory. And then like, yeah. like, oh, like, oh, we met at the Mario Baba film festival or whatever. And it's like, yeah, just have a little, a little scene between them. Just talking about their relationship. And again, yeah. though, I'm, not gonna, I'm basing this on just just what I think might have happened. Mm-hmm. If they originally had that part pegged to be played played by Johnny Depp, and they were like, he he will bring the emotional baggage because Johnny, why, why no forever? Was why the no thing. forever? The best tattoo yeah. in history. Yeah, if you can get, and you know, during the trial, of course, Winona spoke highly of Johnny. He was like, he, he was never like that with me. He was always, he was always, a, you know, we're not going to get into that, but like she, she at least spoke highly of him. I was like, I can't imagine yeah, him doing that. Yeah, let's clarify. We're not saying he didn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. We're just saying that she specifically has a good But if, if he, if right. it was, was revealed that, yeah, it was Johnny Depp and then you got the two of them on screen. Edward... Edward Scissorhands and Winona Ryder back on screen together, that would have had a, an emotional heft inherent to it. True. Right. Instead you wouldn't of, need the dialogue. You wouldn't need to write it in. It would yeah. be there. All the fans mm-hmm. would just be like, oh, it's the two of them. They're back. They're back together. But now we got like <laughs> Winona and man, <laughs> which is some guy. Uh, and you're like, yeah, the, 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 the way, because Winona's selling it, like well, the way she talks about him is like, yeah, I believe that she really did love this guy. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, the the, the chemistry is just not really there between because the, it's just like, okay, uh, well, he's talking to Astrid quite a bit, <laughs> but he's not, <laughs> he's not really talking to her. So, you know, they has a little thing where she's like, so I uh, see you're still uh, not uh, buttoning your shirts properly. He's like, oh, you get off my back, when you're, uh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh no, I don't want him to fall out. Yeah. I, I love though again that like so they you know they find each other fairly easily in the afterlife, but I love the kind of weird thing of. Delia finds Charles, just recognizes him without even the top without half of the his head. body. Yeah. <laughs> but as soon as she sees that body walking around, she's like, oh, that's my, that's my husband. <laughs> there, there he is. Yeah. I genuinely love that because it's almost like in the afterlife, you don't need it's, – it's not about physical things. You, you feel it. It's like you're connected spiritually, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, mm. only, only final note I have because uh, I see it's still scribbled down here because I made a couple of things when I got out. It's been like, oh, make sure to mention that. Mm-hmm. Is that I love that they did plant a little red flag with Jeremy mm. that was um because I think at one point he makes he's supposed to be around the same age as Astrid, I think. Yeah. But then he makes reference to happy days. He makes he says something about like, oh the, I feel like I'm the I'm like Richie Cunningham in Happy Days. Oh, he does say that. And yeah. she has a moment of like, what? <laughs> like what what the hell's happy days? Which oh, indicates that he's actually he's much, much older than and then you find out, like, yeah, he died in like the seventies or whatever. So he's been he's been lying over the whole damn time. Oh, that's amazing! I didn't I didn't think about that. That makes it even better. Yeah, and I, but then I just for like the amount of times I'm going to work now with a bunch of twenty year olds, and they're they, they don't know any of the references I'm making anymore. No, get get this now. I was talking to this guy at work. How old is he? Twenty one, maybe. And we were talking about movies, and he's like, oh, you know, I won't watch anything before the 90s. Like, no, why, why would you want to watch that? Why would you want to watch that? It's too old. I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> so it's like, what's all like, what, like Star Wars and stuff you want going to? No, you won't watch that. No, no, Jesus no. Christ. Yeah. Oh, Beetlejuice. Like... The, 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 you know. Yeah. No, he said he saw it once, and he didn't like it. So yeah. he's like, oh. Well, well, these people, these I friggin', know, I friggin people. that's baffling to me because I watch stuff from before my era. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like, most of my favorite movies from the seventies and eighties. I think even <laughs> in this, though, you get like Astrid also makes reference to talking about Mario Baba. Like it's just like oh, it yeah. seems she knows. Like that, that's all friggin' Technicolor slash black and white stuff from like the fifties and sixties. You know, it's just exactly. You gotta expand your palates, people. You know. Yes. It's, it can't Agreed. all be. Everyone needs that advice. <laughs> it can't all be Robert Downey Jr. in an iron suit, you know. <laughs> I'd rather it wasn't at all, to be honest. <laughs> uh, you have to get some sting and a metal nappy on occasion. Go, 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 go back, <laughs> further back. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the you know. I'm sure there'll be a, afterwards. Be like a billion things I've, we we forgot to mention, uh, yeah. and maybe we'll maybe we will come back and do a commentary of Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I think that'd uh, be fun. Yeah. We could do that, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'd I'm listen ready. to that. Um, unless anyone else has any specific notes, shall we? Uh, shall we go regress back into the netherworld from whence we came? Absolutely. I, I'm off to marry Monica Bellucci. So I'll see, I'll <laughs> okay. see you later, everybody. 
I think I just one little one last little thing, and and particularly when I said like I really want you know wait waiting for this to come to home video and want to rewatch it. Um, one of the things I picked up, well, I didn't pick up um, from the first film, but from listening to Beetlejuice Minute, which broke down uh, you know the, the first film one minute at a time, which unfortunately I don't think is available anymore. <gasps> I don't think their site is up. Um, <sighs> But yeah, they were yeah really quick 15, 20 minute episodes, but they were, you know, filmmakers and film school people and, and kind of approaching it from that angle. And they talked a lot about the color, which mm. once, you, you know, I didn't pick up on it, but once you pick up on it, or if you do pick up on it, like the, um, like death is red, like the bridge, the covered bridge where Adam and Barbara die, like that's red. And then the afterlife is green and then blue is something else. Like the, the use of color in the first ah. film is really smart. And like, it really, it's very interesting once, once you kind of look at it, or it was for me once I was kind of alerted to that and, and looking at it. And so I was specifically looking at the use of color in this film and it like on first viewing, it seemed uneven. And I wonder if there's like, you know, more method to the madness that I'll pick up later, but things like, um, Jeremy's house is red and he's wearing that red jacket, um, mm. his Halloween costume that uh, where he, yeah. you know, where his parents says he looked like Richie Cunningham. So he's wearing red, which is like the red bridge where um, Adam and Barbara die in the first film. And then um, like the netherworld is green and they pick up on that um, in the opening when, um, you know, we're on the set of ghost house and then Lydia cuts to the, you know, the clip, on like the farm or whatever and like that and it's like all green light mm. um when they do that so um yeah so like the use of color and stuff where which i, I picked up in a little bit in, in some of the scenes but uh that's something in particular i really want to look for um mm. you know when i can kind of watch at my own leisure at home so hell yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do the same i didn't know about that excellent but, uh yeah yeah so but overall you know very good film I, and I do think like I wasn't quite as excited as as John was or is. I don't think anyone but, uh, is as, like I'm, I'm the biggest fan in the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, lots of smiles, lots of fun, and I I do think it's something that's going to age well. I think um, rewatching and even doing being able to do like a double feature back to back, I think mm. it's going to hold up and, and match very well, which is very rare for a sequel and even rarer for a sequel that's you know separated by three decades yeah um, for oh, them to yeah. you know recapture that magic but uh mm. yeah it's astonishing what they've managed to do uh, and yeah. burton's back baby yeah. burton's well back. maybe just this once but you know still <laughs> still back yeah. on form yeah these could be like the like an m night Shyamalan scenario where it's just like he's back <laughs> oh wait no he's not no no he's not <laughs> he's tumbled again <laughs> <laughs> but yeah m, m night every time though he's like he's brought out something new Let's see. Let's see if he's not this time. Every time, every time, I was like, "No, he hasn't. Not again." <laughs> oh, I'll yeah. defend some of his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I should I should say though, actually, um, and I'll, you know, it's not been recorded yet. It may not come to pass. Fingers crossed. It's in the works. But mm. of course, they did try throughout the years to uh, make sequels to Beetlejuice. Yes, and of course, one of them been infamously entitled uh, "Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian." Yeah, I'm kind of torn on that. Uh, and the thing is, uh, people might be familiar with uh, Batman in the past. We have done table reads of abandoned screenplays, such as the original Tom Mankiewicz version of Batman, Superman Lives, et cetera, et cetera. And I discovered, I always thought that Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian was just like a pitch that they threw out. Oh, apparently it got quite far along, didn't it? It got a full screenplay written by Jonathan Gems, the guy who did Mars Attacks. Uh, and... Oh. In the works to release around Halloween time, uh, I can announce that we like are attempting to do a full table read <laughs> of Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian, which should hopefully be appearing on your podcasters and on YouTube and whatnot um, around that time. So, like, I'm, I'm putting it down. Like, it will happen. It's definitely it's in the works. Everything's confirmed so far now, barring and you know lightning striking literally everybody involved. Uh, it should it should come to pass, but like uh, I'm always very cautious about promising things that might not happen. Yeah, might I never appear. promise anything. Yeah, but that is currently that is in the works of uh, in the middle of going through the script to uh, parse out the parts. I've already cast uh, Lydia and Delia. There, I'm very excited oh. about the choices made. Uh, who's, who's Beetlejuice? Well, I uh, no, don't tell me I'll spoil it. But yeah, eventually, eventually we'll be coming. Uh, Hopefully for Halloween will be the Wee. if you're if you've seen this movie and you've uh, tired of hearing us talk about it, 
you can hear us talking about another sequel by <laughs> acting it out, basically. So. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Love should it, we... Yeah. Um, should, um, what was your phrase you had instead of going off into the dark, dark night? You had a phrase. What was it? Descend. Regress back into the netherworld. <laughs> that was it. Should we regress? I believe we should. <laughs> Let's regress, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to really plug anything. You know us. Uh, find us everywhere, as always, as always. Uh, Sean, you already plugged stuff, didn't you? Uh, have you got anything else? Yeah. No, I have. Yeah, Next Scene Pod. I actually have a Patreon. Um, and you know, patreon.com slash Next Scene Pod. Um, I do monthly special episodes where I talk about stuff. Um, if you want to chip in a buck or two to help uh, help the podcast process along. Oh, also, um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it once or mentioned it twice. So I'll mention it a third time. Casablanca Minute. Speaking of things that hey. that might not happen. Um, <laughs> visit. Yeah. You know, so I've got this is a, a, a movie by minute podcast that I think I started like four years ago. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not yet to minute zero, but I have re- released a few uh, trailers and preview episodes and some stuff. So you can go over to Casablanca Minute or CasablancaMin.com, I think, or something like that. And uh, maybe check that out. And, uh, you know, maybe that'll happen. Uh, we'll see. So, yeah, it that's will it. happen. Just believe. it will happen. We'll make it happen. Yeah. We'll believe it happened. But uh, let's continue. Continue our descent back into let's, the Netherworld. Let's do it. See you next time. Beetle. Mites? I don't know what I'm going to call you. (laughs) Beetle bites? (laughs) Beetle bites! See you next time, suckers. Hey, folks, begging your pardon. Excuse me, sorry to barge in. Now let's skip the tears and start on the whole, you know, being dead thing.